So we have two talks this morning and then one this afternoon. So the first speaker is somebody that we know really well, right? Theo Kolokolnikov from Dalhousie University, who will talk about pattern density distribution in PDEs. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really enjoying my time here. Um, is there an echo or there's an is it, there's an echo. Is it possible to fix it? Hello? There's an echo somewhere. Testing. Yeah. Testing. Coming from from there. It's okay. Testing, testing. Yeah. You okay? Oh, so it's just echo for me, not for the rest of you. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, spikes in in various reaction diffusion systems. And um, the questions that I'm interested in is mainly how the spikes are distributed in a domain, okay? So this is a, an example of a spike, a spike cluster in gear Meinhardt system. Um, it's in, I'll, t I'll, uh, I'll show you the system in a minute, but basically this is on all of R2, okay? And there is this cluster that forms because there's a precursor, some inhomogeneity in the system so if you don't if you don't have any homogeneity in all of R2, what would happen is all the spikes would drift away from each other and there wouldn't be any steady state. But due to this precursor, it kind of confines them to this region in a domain and they form this kind of a hexagonal clusters. So this is uh, mainly what I'll be talking about today. Okay, but before I talk about Gear Meinhardt, let me uh, talk about the simple elliptic, elliptic PDE here that's been studied for more than 30 years, 40 years. Uh, very well known. Uh, if you don't have this term here, the epsilon, you said epsilon to zero, then it's been, that's it's ex extensively studied since the 80s, since this paper here by a lot of PDE people. But let me, so one of the main results for, for this system is um, uh, there's spikes that form, okay? And if you have a f bounded domain, then the spikes kind of form, uh, uh, a bo uh, they, they satisfy a bulk clustering uh, problem so that each spike is located on the domain furthest point away from all the other spikes. So it's a uh, bulk packing problem. Say spikes form. Oh, I, yeah. So but there's no time derivative there. Uh, so I'm mistaken. They, they actually, if you put ut on the left hand side, <coughs> then um, there are spike solutions, steady states, that, okay. that, that consist of spikes. So but, but they're I'm, all unstable, actually. Right. But people still like to study this a lot. So you have the u square term there. Yeah. Which means if you put a ut on the left hand side, they grow without bound. So you're yeah. studying steady states of this equation. That's right. And if memory serves, if the domain is large, there can actually be many steady states. Uh, yeah, so, um, but uh, mostly it's studied for a bounded domain. Oops. So, but Sorry. even in a bounded domain, you can have multiple spike solutions for that, I believe. Yes, for mul uh, that's, that's exactly the setting. So if you have a bounded domain, there is multiple spikes and um, they satisfy a ball packing problem. So this is the famous result from the 90s by, by this authors here. That's one of the main results in this, in this field. But N is not determined by the domain size. You can actually have many no. different, okay. Yeah. So, so you're, you're taking that equation, you're putting it into N. Yes. And solving right. it. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
but if you so that's on a bounded domain if you don't have a boundary and if epsilon is zero then all the spikes uh, the, the cannot be confined so then there's the, then the only steady state is a single spike a radially symmetric spike if there's no boundaries okay however as soon as we add this in homogeneity let's call it sort of a confinement well then well, it's at least that's what this uh, this people proved in back in 1980s. Because yeah, there's periodic, you have an infinite periodic set of spikes also. Yes. Uh, so if you if you I agree, yeah. There's a one spike solution, and then yeah. there's an infinite spike solution. There's that's no true. Finite spike solutions. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I said this incorrectly. Okay, anyway, so let's say for finite spikes, if you have just finite spikes, then you need something, some inhomogeneity or it's like, like either a boundary or something else to keep them confined, okay? And so uh, here, just put this uh, kind of a confinement term, and then you have multiple spikes. And then uh, sort of a relatively standard calculation what, uh, what you can do is do sort of a standard asymptotic reduction, you know, solubility condition, etc. And uh, you kind of obtain a reduced system for the spike locations. So rather than solving the full PDE, it's enough to just look at um, where the spikes are located and call this their location xj in 2D, okay? And the location will satisfy this kind of algebraic system of equations which is uh, kind of a fully coupled, okay? So this k here is, uh, in one dimension, it would be e to the minus r, and in two dimensions, it would be um, Bessel k zero function, which is the Green's function, uh, in one or two dimensions, and it decays, okay? And so what's, uh, the reason why it's there is because the spikes, they look something like this, that's how a typical spike looks like, and it's concentrated, uh, or, or they're, f uh, they're far away from each other, and then there's another spike right there somewhere, and then they interact through their tails, okay? And because of this interaction, uh, that's where this term comes from. And on the left-hand side, that comes from just confinement term. Okay, and so this is the system that one can derive as sort of a reduced system for the location of the spikes. Sorry. Yep. Uh, what is a formal definition of a spike? A formal definition of spike. Um, or informal, but... <laughs> yeah, so there's a solution, so this is the, the system. Okay, and there is a, uh, there's an exact solution to this. And let's just say in one in one dimension, okay? So there's an exact solution that you can derive, or you can also do a face portrait analysis that looks like this, okay? So that's what I call a spike. So the reason why I call it a spike is because if I look far away from far away enough, then it becomes looks like more like a delta function, okay? And essentially, the, the, the xj would be the center of the spike, okay? And so because they're far away from each other, they, they barely interact except for their uh, exponentially small tails. So essentially, they're they characterized by exponential decay. So yeah, that's so right. Is, There's uh, exponential as, decay as in, in physics, the far field. In physics, it would mean I'm localized state. It is a localized okay. state, exactly. Okay, so um, to solve numerically this system is relatively easy. This, the, the simplest thing to do is to embed it into this ODE, okay? And then if you run this ODE, it will converge to some steady state, and the steady state you can see satisfies this equation. So that's the um, numerical way to do, to do this, and, and when you solve it, this is the kind of solutions that you obtain. This is in one dimension, okay, uh, for some parameter a, and this is in two dimensions, 
Okay, and so what's what we see here, especially in 2D, is this is characterized by this lattice hexagonal lattice structure in, in, in the interior, but it's non-uniform hexagonal lattice. So locally, it looks like a hexagonal, but globally, it's non-uniform density. Okay, and so uh, the question is, uh, what can we say about this this states uh, analytically? Okay. Okay, so let's do the one-dimensional system first of all. So the key to this uh, to the analysis here is that uh, the because of this exponential decay and in the scaling regime that's relevant for our problem, it turns out that essentially this this x j's are all well spaced out, so they're, they're spaced. Uh, so locally it looks pretty uniform. So uh, uh, so the trick is to expand this kind of like similar like uh, Laplace's method for integration essentially this is sum is dominated by so so this sum is for you fix a k okay and then you look at the sum as j goes from 1 to n okay and the dominant terms are the ones where j is very close to k okay and so uh, there you can basically expand everything in Taylor series so if, if we look at um, define this u to be the the interspike distance, right? So we order all the spikes, okay? X1, X2 are all ordered. And if, and if we define this interspike distance, then we can expand the, um, the difference X k plus L minus X k, essentially in Taylor series. And we can truncate, and if we truncate it to two orders, and assuming that the rest of the terms get smaller, which, which is uh, what happens here, and then we can expand everything in this, then this becomes just this this kind of a sum, this geometric type type of series, okay. And that's that's the key trick. And then you can explicitly sum this up, okay. And uh, when you do that, uh, what happens is you get the derivative of this expression to lead in order. So you need to expand it to two orders and. Uh, you obtain the, the derivative, so so you're looking at the uh, the, the, the derivative uh, in in terms of the interspike distance, okay, which is this term here, and that's what pops out here. And uh, then when you plug it back, when you plug all of this back into this equation you're going to get ux, remember u is the interspike distance, so you s get the derivative of, the, of the, inter, the, 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 the interspike distance with respect to space, okay, equal to so times this function equal to a times x. And that's just a separable ODE. This is the separable ODE that you get. And that ODE defines, determines the um, uh, determines the interspike distance essentially. That's an, that's that's the equation for the interspike distance in the in the limit where n becomes very large. Okay. So um, there is, this equation is coupled to uh, to this integral kind of a boundary condition. This just basically says that uh, so if u is the interspike distance, then one over u is the spike density. So the integral of the density is the number of spikes. And this R is where U blows up. So from this ODE, it's easy to see that U will blow up. And this is what it looks like. So it blows up at some point R. And that's where the interspike distance goes to, to infinity. You can also see this from the simulations. Of course, because of the finiteness effect, it, it's, it's you know, you only have finite main spike, but in a, in a continuum limit, the, the, this interspike distance goes to infinity as you approach this boundary. Okay, so you're solving for this boundary R along with the U coupled through this integral equation. Okay, so in other words, the way to solve it if, is, is this is a first order ODE, so you can solve it if you fix U at zero, right? So if you fix u at zero, then you integrate it until it blows up. Call that r, where it blows up, okay? And then you adjust this integral to be equal to n. So you adjust uh, u of zero so until this integral is equal to n. That's the way to think of it, okay? 
And so that uniquely determines the solution. And uh, when you plot the solution, it, uh, the, this is the comparison between uh, asymptotics and the numerics. You can see with, with, this is with 50 mesh points. You really can't see the difference between the, the, the discrete and the continuum limit here, except at the boundaries. The boundary is something. So, so this, uh, this, the, the whole approximation assumes that you're in the interior. But, but uh, from this integral condition, you can actually get what the boundary is. And there's some deviation from, from the discrete at the boundary, but otherwise it still recovers very well the, um, this, this, this cluster radius, okay? the solution cluster radius, as well as the interior density. So this is, this is, how, this is um, how it works for this simple system. Okay, so let me mention a few things about this. Uh, and uh, Andy, Andy would know about this. This, this, this equation also appears in, in, in swarming literature, um, maybe written in, in this form here. Uh, this is kind of an interaction kernel, and this is confinement potential, and this is repulsive. This kernel is repulsive. And there are techniques, for example, in paper by um, Andy and Chad, uh, the prime primer of swarming, okay, where they also study this and they also solve this basically and come up with a steady state uh, with a steady state solution. Okay, and the techniques that they use there are basically integral. You convert this into an integral equation. This is completely different regime than what I'm studying here. Okay, completely different. Um, and the difference is in uh, it, it comes down to the size of this parameter a. What I'm looking at here is when this parameter a is very small. Uh, what um, in the paper by Andy and Chad, where they study this, where the parameter a is very large of order n. Okay, and that's the when this parameter is of order n, you get a completely different steady state, and the, there is a completely different set of techniques um, that. Uh, that can be used to derive this completely steady state, right? So, so here another thing is, as I increase n, this 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 steady state increases in size. The the radius is proportional to n. Uh, whereas in the regime that Andy and Chad study, uh, it's confined. So as I, as they increase n, the the boundaries don't increase, and only the density increases proportionally to n. So it's the opposite regime here. Okay, so um, one more comment is that this, this ODE, you can you know, integrate this, get this nice integral, but that's it, right? Okay, even with this integral, you can't really so say, that's, that's all you can essentially say for you, um, and then you'll still have to plug this U into this, this integral condition to, um, to solve for you, because this to express it in terms of N, and this cannot be done explicitly, so you still have to do this numerically, but that's fine, yeah. Okay, now um, my primary goal today is to talk about 2D clusters. Okay. So this method that I've just described in one dimension, the key, um, the key point there is that uh, even though the equation is, looks very, very much fully coupled, Right, looks like it's some non-local thing. It turns out that because of this kernel decay, in a regime which is important for PDEs, essentially you only care about nearby neighbors. So you can make this approximation where you tailor expand everything around within a neighborhood, okay, and then the rest of the the, the rest of the cluster doesn't contribute much. So this is very special, and it's because of this strong decay here in, in this kernel. And, because of, and, and, uh, and with this, uh, it's possible to actually, because of that, it's possible also to uh, derive steady states in 2D. So the overall density is non-uniform, but, but locally we can assume some uniformity, or at least expand in Taylor series, okay? And the other thing that we need to do to carry this through is to, to, is to assume explicitly that locally the structure is hexagonal. 
This is what happens, in, 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 this, this is what numerics tell us. Uh, it's not clear exactly why it's so, and I'm not proving that the structure is hexagonal. I'm using this as my basis assumption, and from that assumption, I will derive the steady states. Okay. All right, so uh, this is how it works. Again, we'll look at this uh, now. Uh, we'll look at the u of x to be like the, 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 the minimal distance to, to, the, to our neighbor at, at any point xk. Okay, and then we can estimate the sum in terms of this function phi 2, which is a lattice. It's, it's, a, it's a sum over a, over a hexagonal lattice. Okay. So the, this, this calculation is similar to what I've done in 1D, what I've shown in 1D, except that you need to do this in two dimensions, so you have to expand the lawn. Essentially, locally, you get a hexagonal lattice, so that's why you sum up over, over all the hexagonal lattice points. So this L, is a, now it's a double sum, and this parameter L is L1 plus e to the i pi over 3 L2, okay? And L1 and L2 are integers. Okay, so this is the sum over all the lattice points. So it's a double sum, it doesn't really have... So in 1D, this had kind of an explicit formulation because you're summing up like e to, the, e to the L times L squared or something like that, okay? But in 2D, it's just, well, I, I, I'm not aware of, of sort of any explicit formulation, but however, this is some function that is just a function of u, and it's independent of any parameters, okay? So think of it as just some given thing that you can sketch and that you can compute and whatever. So even though we can't do this explicitly, analytically, the double sum, we can still sketch it, and it's independent of any parameters in the, in the question. That's the point, okay? And with this function, now the equation for the steady state becomes, so this becomes ur times phi 2 of u. So ur is derivative with respect to the radius. I'm assuming radial symmetry here. So you get this ODE still, separable ODE. <coughs> and now uh, we have this, so, so now what does the density look like? Well, 1 over u is a linear density because u is the distance to the neighbors. So then we integrate in two dimensions, you have to 1 over u squared, and then there's a prefactor here that comes from the fact that we have a hexagonal lattice. Okay, and then you integrate that, that's, that's the, the two-dimensional density then, and you get n equal to n. So you solve this ODE with this phi 2 of u, like given explicitly by the formula on the previous page, okay? and then um, coupled to this boundary condition. And this is the result. This is with 500 points. This is the steady state computed numerically. This here, the red line, the red dashed line, is the radius r predicted from this analytical calculation. And this is actual density, or should I say u, the, the, the distance to the neighbors plotted versus r, which is like the distance from the origin, r here, for each one of those points. You can see some noise here because, you know, it's in 2D. And this is the analytical prediction. So it works really well, as you can see. Okay, and uh, I should mention the scaling is that if we double n and half this parameter a, then you get the same spike density except the domain doubles in size, or uh, it becomes the twice uh, the area doubles in size. So the radius is multiplied by square root of two. Okay, so now let's get to uh, the, 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 so this was kind of a warm-up example, okay, that I've been doing so far. So now, uh, so now the gear meinhardt system, which is uh, probably the most famous reaction diffusion system that has the spike patterns, where they are stable. So, so in the previous example, all the spike patterns is just more of a theoretical exercise because they're not actually stable when you have a single PDE. But when you have this uh, 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 reaction diffusion system, it can stabilize the spikes, and you get stable spikes patterns. So this is, you can actually observe them from solving this full PD. Okay, and so the, again, there is a standard reduction that I'm going to skip, and then at the end of the day, you get this equation, this coupled algebraic system for location of the spikes xj as well as what is hk that's the height of the 
of the H, H is the inhibitor variable. So there's this epsilon here, right, which squeeze, which, which makes the spike really, the epsilon is the extent of the spike. So for the GM, the spike looks like this. So A really looks like a delta function, okay? And uh, the extent here is the order epsilon. And H looks something like this, at least in one dimension, okay? And this is H. And uh, so the height here is what I call HK. And the location of the spike is what I call XK. So in, in, this, in this system, we have to solve for both the heights and the location. So there is, this, the, there is uh, you know, this, this equations here are the equations for the heights, and these equations are, are equations for location. They are fully coupled to each other. So it's a highly nonlinear system, okay? And if you have like two or three spikes, maybe you can solve it when you have only two spikes with some symmetry. With three, it becomes difficult, right? And with five, let's say, it's like so nonlinear that it's impossible to solve analytically. However, if you take like 10 spikes or 100 spikes when n becomes large, then it becomes possible to do something asymptotically for, for this system here. Okay, so we look at the continuum limit of the system and using the same sort of techniques that I've shown you in, in for the warm-up problem, it's possible to obtain the solution, okay? And I'll just write this, the solution here. So now there's all this, all this lattice sum, it involves a bunch of lattice sums like this, okay? And then you get an ODE for the interspike, the, the, like the nearest neighbor U of R would be like the nearest neighbor distance. And you get an ODE which is separable. This mu here is the precursor. Yeah, question? Um, on, the, on the previous slide, so you, you start with the PDE. Yeah. And then so, so somehow the number of spikes capital N is determined by that PDE? Oh, good question. No, it's not determined by the PDE. You can fix an N. So there's solutions that have that consist of two spikes. There's solutions that consist of three spikes. There's solutions that consist of n spikes. So you choose capital N. Yeah. Okay. So there is some. I'm sweeping under the carpet here the fact that n spikes can be stable or unstable, and there are some thresholds that I'm not talking about here. But at least for the steady state, you can fix an n, and you get uh, a system this with n spikes and it determines their locations. Okay. Yeah, so we can fix an N, and then we can fix an N large. That's the important thing here. Okay, and this is the solution. So, so this is uh, uh, U is the, uh, yeah, the spike density, or one over the spike density, or whatever. And this is, this is the height is expressed in terms of U. And this, this U has all the lattice sums inside of it, but they're all like just some functions uh, independent of parameters that you can explicitly compute, no problem. And there's also log epsilon inside here. Okay, and then there is this, is, and it's coupled to this, uh, this um, integral constraint for spike density as before. Okay, so does it work? Yes, it does. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it. So here's an example with 500 spikes. Uh, the color indicates the height of the spike because it's not uniform anymore. The height are different for this, uh, different spikes. Um, and this is the asymptotic radius computed for this ODE. The red line, you can see it's, it's, it's the, basically the density distribution compared to the, to the actual numerical neighborhood distance, which is the blue lines, okay? And this, is, this line is the radius of this, of this cluster computed from that ODE. So this is like the asymptotic calculation. And th on, this on this graph here, I have the spike heights. Again, agreeing so well with, uh, with the numerics, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Although it's not really amazing because there's 500 particles here. So the, the N is really big here. Yeah. So with the bigger the N, the better it works. Okay. So this was just, a, just sort of a made up. So all I did is I solved 
the so the to 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 plot that picture to plot the 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 the, the, the this hexagonal lattice. What I did, I solved this ODE. So I, I replaced the zero by x x prime x k prime of t. So I turned this into an ODE system, and I evolved it until it's steady state. And that's how this hexagonal lattice was computed. Okay. Um, so this is not computed from the PDE. But now let's compare with the actual PDE calculations of the original system. So this original system, and let's solve it with PDE. Now, okay, because of the, you know, because I don't want to have, I don't want to wait for like too long. I just have an example here with 20 spikes. Sorry, the color is maybe not the best, but I think there's about, what is it, 20 spikes here, right? Just 20 spikes. So the domain is, uh, actually the computational domain was from minus 15 to plus 15. But the spikes are clustered in this cluster because there is finite radius here. And it's zero outside, so I just show this, this where the cluster is. This is the variable A, the activator, and this is the variable H, the inhibitor. There's two variables, A and H. Okay, and now this picture shows the locations the, the, the black dots is the, the centers extracted from the full PDEs. The green dots are the centers as found by the ODE calculation. The reduced ODE calculation is the green dots. Uh, and, and this dashed line is the asymptotic radius of the, in the continuum limit. So it's, it, it predicts pretty well what, what the radius should be, even with 20 spikes. And this picture is really kind of amazing. Like you can see how well the height is, the height of the spikes is predicted. I say amazing because um, it's it's kind of this is uh, sort of the moment of truth, if you like. Um, when you do this calculation with PDE and compare PDE to the reduced system, actually is is um, um, when I first did it, I I, I I thought it would be a very bad comparison. The reason is because there's log epsilon in this ODE, and whenever you have log epsilon, that's a big error. So I'm kind of amazed that, that the agreement is, is, is so good, uh, even with this log epsilon in there. The error looks is log epsilon, so it should be big, but it's not so big actually. It's actually quite, quite good. Okay, so that's the two-dimensional Gear-Meinhardt model. So let me talk about a few words about the one-dimensional case, which I, uh, which I haven't derived. In 1D, you kind of do the same kind of stuff. And the nice thing is you get a very nice explicit formula for the, for the density. And, and in 1D, everything works really extremely accurately. So the error, I, think, I don't know what, I haven't looked at what the error is, but it's really good. Like even with 10 spikes, you get a really good agreement. And this, is, uh, this shows the com comparison of the asymptotics derived from the system and, uh, and the full numerics of the PDE. Okay, so now let me uh, switch gears a little bit. I'll talk about another reaction diffusion, the Schnackenberg or vegetation model. Yeah, before you, 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 you change problem. So you explained to us basically the distribution of the steady state yeah. given N, and you have this uh, very mm -hmm. nice um, uh, result. Now, if you start with such distribution, and now you look at the time-dependent problem, yeah. What happened? You have, uh, I mean, you, st you stay at steady state, or you have, you have a, yeah, you see that there is an evolution, or something start to change, let's say the position, or there is. So again, um, uh, th this steady state can be stable or it can be unstable. If it's unstable, what happens is that some of the spikes will disappear. So there is a maximal n for which this 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 uh, pattern is stable. So if you start with the number of spikes that's, that's bigger than some maximal n, then there's this coarsening process until the number of spikes c becomes below that number n, and then this theory applies. So I haven't, I, I'm not talking here about the stability, but there's this whole issue of stability which is very important, and it's a, it's a, big, uh, it's a, it's a big question. And we have results for stability in 1D, but 2D is, is, is trickier, so I'm, that's why I'm not talking about it today. 
But yeah, absolutely, there is issue of stability here. And actually, I'm going to talk about, the, for the Schnackenberg model, I'll, I'll talk about this. So this is another reaction diffusion system, and it has similar kind of solutions that, that, that consist of pulses. So in this case, there is U and V. So uh, let, uh, this, this model is uh, also called Klausmeier model, or Schnackenberg model. They're all variation of the same thing. So uh, it... Um, the simplest way to, to, to understand it is in the context of vegetation patterns. So U would be the, uh, the density of vegetation and V would be the density of water. And so what you have is the, the vegetation diffuses through like seed dispersal. The, the, uh, you know, this is decay term. And then when there's water, this makes the vegetation grow. This U squared times V. And for the for the water, okay, let's say there's VT on the left hand side. It doesn't matter if it's zero or VT, it's the same story. Um, and then there is this term, this is precipitation, okay? So there's this feed, feed rate of water here that's space dependent in this problem. And then when, uh, and this term is due to vegetation absorbing the water. And I scale it in this way just to, to make the asymptotics work out nicer. You don't have, you don't need this one over epsilon here, you can get rid of it. but this is the scaling we'll use. Okay, this is a very well-known model, and here what I'm interested in is when this, um, the, the precipitation rate, A, is space-dependent, okay? And so here's a, an example of what can happen in this model. Let me play this movie. So here, what I'm doing is I'm taking, before I play the movie, I take the, the, this, this, this uh, precipitation function to be, so there's more precipitation in the middle than there is at the edges. It looks something like this. Okay, and basically I'm, I'm increasing the overall precipitation, A0 is increased. And this is what I'm plotting on the, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis I'm plotting the actual uh, solution for the for u u of x, and there's pulse splitting and another etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I'll play the movie corresponding to this picture. It's uh, unfortunately I have to wait for for a second. Should work. The density is. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as as the uh, a here is this a zero, and uh, this basically the, the water precipitation is increasing, and then there's more more vegetation that come comes in. Okay, and eventually you get this kind of distribution of density that looks something like that. Okay, and so the goal is to compute this, uh, the final density distribution for, for a fixed A0. Okay. There's also the opposite thing happens if you decrease A0, then, then there's spike coarsening. So if you have, with this, if you start with many spikes, and as you decrease A0, some spikes get, get eliminated. So, yeah, one, while we're waiting, like, um, is there a reason in your, okay, so you can't see it, but in the precipitation thing, you have like one plus 0 0.5 cosine? Yeah. Right, so is that one like actually really important or? Uh, well, I just wanted something that's positive everywhere in the domain, because uh, the domain is from minus pi to plus pi. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Never mind. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, so. So there's a coarsening that happens, and, and the coarsening happens at the boundaries. Yeah, they have less and less spikes. There's more precipitation in the center, so there's more vegetation there, and it's more deserty at the, at the edges, there's less of it, so that's where the coarsening mostly takes place. Uh, from the numerics, num yeah, I mean, the numerics must choose one or the other spike, right? So, and once it's, this one is dead, then of course it's asymmetric and the spikes move to the center and, yeah. It's, there's very complicated dynamics that, that happen here. Until eventually you get like one spike left. Okay, so th the first goal is to compute the steady state. The steady state here. And this is basically, I'm giving you away the, the punchline here. We're able to compute this uh, density distribution of the spikes. But the calculation is completely different from, from the guillaume Meinhardt model that I just showed you. And, and um, so again, uh, the technique is, is kind of, the, the starting point is the same thing. You write down the reduce system for spike positions and spike heights. And here's the reduce system in this case. So it's some equations that uh, this is a well-known sort of technique to get that. And then you start to analyze that, that reduce system. This is the steady state, it looks like this. And again, this SJ is sort of the height of the spikes, or related to the, to the heights of the spike. P here is like, uh, is, is the double integral of, of A, of this A, that's P, okay. And, uh, and then XK are, are spike positions. Okay, and here we look at the continuum density we define the density by putting a delta function at each of the spike locations. And then this system becomes, this sum becomes this integral. So this sum turns into an integral formulation like this. Okay, so this, there's two equations, one for the spike heights, the other one for spike positions. And then so you have two, these two integral equations that you need to solve at the same time. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And um, there's uh, this big N here. So to leading order, if I just can disregard this term, then to leading order, you get this integral. The problem is, if you do this at leading order calculation, is that, let me see if I can scroll. Oops, how do I? Unfortunately, this is not my laptop, so. Ah, I need to scroll. Can I scroll so it doesn't like, how do I scroll like little by little instead of page by page? No, this is scrolling page by page. I just want to scroll little by little. Okay, this will do. No. I don't know what you mean by little by little. This one? Uh, no, no, to the right, 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 right. It's the the one with the, oh, yeah, the, yeah, that one, I think. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, this is the leading order calculations. Okay, and and you get to leading order. This is two two integrals. Okay. The problem is that these two two integral equations are actually identical to each other. So if you take this and you differentiate this with respect to x, you get this integral. Okay. So actually, this is one and the same. So what that means is that uh, you cannot just disregard this. I mean, to leading order, you have to, because that's high order term. But unfortunately, then you cannot solve 
for your integral equations because you have two unknowns, s of y and rho of y. Rho is the spike locations and s of y is the spike heights. But only to linear order, you only have one equation. However, there is still something that you can do, even at this level, and that is, if you look at this function x minus y, well, that's the Green's functions in, in 1D, right? So if you take the de second derivative of this, you get a delta function. So if you differentiate this twice, right? if you differentiate this twice, you get a delta function. So when you differentiate this twice, this integral becomes local. Okay, you get a delta function here. And then you get, so you get s times rho is equal to a of x. a of x is this function here. Okay, so even though you cannot solve for both s and rho, you still, at leading order, this is all you get, is you had the product of those two equal to a of x. Okay, and in order to go further, you actually have to go to the next order and approximate the difference between this integral and the discrete sum. Okay. And the key, f and, and the, key uh, the key tool here is this euler maclaurin formula, which provides you exactly that. If you have a discrete sum, then you can, to lead in your order, it's this integral, and then there's correction terms, okay? And you need these correction terms in order to, to, f to go further, okay? So with this uh, euler maclaurin and you need actually to, this, to go to the second order, okay? So then you can write the sum, this is the linear order, and then you get the next order looks like that. And there you have the derivative of s comes in. Okay. And similarly for this, this sum as well. Okay, and then you expand s in 1 over n squared. And at the end of, res at the, end of the day, you get this ODE that relates the density and s, okay? And it's subject to some constraint. And this is a Riccati ODE in, uh, in the density, you can solve it. Not Riccati, what's it called? Bernoulli, Bernoulli. So Bernoulli ODE, it's exactly solvable. So you do that, and finally you get uh, a solution relating the density and uh, the A here, the precipitation rate. And it's subject to this constraint. And then from that, you can draw all these pictures and it all works really well. And I'm gonna skip a bunch of stuff. But basically, there's all these thresholds that I showed you the, in the movies where you have this coarsening and you have this self-replication. All of that can be derived from that formula, okay? So this formula, that basically gives you the density distribution as a function of the precipitation rate, space dependent, it turns out that there's a fold point as you vary the parameters, the strength of the precipitation rate. Uh, so the solution actually only exists for certain strength of the precipitation rate. There's this strength A0. Okay. And uh, uh, right, and then that, that, and then from that, I'm I'm going to skip all this, but I'll just show you this picture. So what is this picture here? This predicts the number, the maximal number of spots, as a function of of this a zero or so this n here, and this is a zero. As you increase n. Uh, there is, yeah, this is, uh, sorry. Yeah, so this, this is actually, this is the minimal, so there's some spot replication. But basically, this is the, the, the comparison between uh, the asymptotics and the numerics. And it's really remarkably well that it compares. And that's, that was self-replication, and then the other side is the coarsening. So there's actually two sets of thresholds. One is the coarsening or competition instability, where when you decrease the, this precipitation rate A, you get less and less spikes. And the other one is self-replication, where if you increase it too much, you get more and more spikes. 
So this is like kind of the upper and the lower bound for the number of spikes n in the system. And uh, both of these bounds can be predicted from, from this continuum theory and agree very well with, with the actual numerics. So in this case here, here I'm showing the coarsening for uniform A. So here if I just don't have this cosine x, just uniform, then um, there's theory that's been worked out by, you know, st starting with uh, a paper by uh, David Iron, Michael Ward, and Jun Chen Wei in 2000. They worked out this threshold, okay. But here we basically can do this now for any arbitrary density, not just constant density. But here this is, uh, it, 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 it boils down to the same threshold that they worked out in 2000 when you assume the density is constant. And here's an example of non-constant density and the comparison here. This also works. And another example where we have a piecewise density. So, let me see, oops. This is a piecewise density where A is 0.5 for in this region and 1.5 in this region. And then this is the steady state, numerical prediction versus sort of analytical prediction that works really well. And, and also this coarsening thresholds that, that work well as well. Okay. So the, so this is the conclusion is that there is upper and lower bound for the number of spikes that you can have, n min and n max. And this theory essentially gives you the formulas for both this n min and n max, okay? And uh, if you start with the number of spikes either below or above this, then the dynamics will push n within this range. Okay. And they scale very differently. So the admin depends on epsilon and n, n max to leading order is independent of epsilon. And what can, what can well, what's, in, what's interesting is that these two thresholds can actually cross. Okay? Because of the scaling here, you can imagine this is Depends on epsilon, this is independent. So if I, if I change the epsilon, right? If I increase the epsilon, this can eventually, this will increase until eventually it becomes n max. So it's possible for these two thresholds to cross. And when that happens, the spikes can no longer exist. There's no steady state anymore. This can only happen when you have non-constant density. So, so the crossing does not exist for constant density, but for, for non-constant density it does. And here's an example. So here are the parameters in this simulation are chosen precisely so that these two thresholds agree. And, and this is what happens. So when I start the simulation, and this is just, uh, there's no, I'm not wiring the parameters or anything here. Uh, what's going on here is there's a spike, there's a new spike that's being born here. And at the same time, there's spikes that are being destroyed at the boundaries where there's a, not a lot of precipitation. So spikes are being born here where there's a lot of precipitation and being destroyed here where there's not enough precipitation. Okay, and you get this constant uh, loop, sort of creation destruction loop. So here, I'll play the movie. This is the creation destruction loop. And this can only happen when you have non-constant precipitation. And it goes on like this forever. Okay, so I have until uh, 11.05, is that right? 
So very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Bose-Einstein condensates, which is another um, example of this kind of uh, techniques. All right, so, so uh, we'll start with gross pitayevsky equation, which is a well-known model for Bose-Einstein condensate. It's been tested experimentally, and it works real well. So, so a couple of terms here. So this, this is like a, there is a trap that you rotate. So this is like a rotation of the trap. And then the trap is, uh, has this parabolic profile. So this here is the parabolic tra profile of, of the trap. And it confines the vortices to live inside the trap. Okay. And so uh, and this is uh, a well-known model of Bose-Einstein condensates. And, and it's been tested experimentally. So there's this, we have this small damp in here, this gamma. Okay. Uh, so the original model has, has no gamma, okay? But for purposes of numerically trying to reproduce this, this lattices of Bose-Einstein condensates, to solve this numerically, when we add the damping, it really helps the numerics because then it converges to a steady state. Otherwise, it just keeps on rotating like that. So, but the steady state is the same whether you have gamma zero or non-zero. There's also some physical justification for having a small, small damping and uh, Anyway, so that's, w but mainly it's for the numerics. Okay, so let me show you an e example of, of the kind of dynamics that you can have. So here, if I increase the rotation rate, then, um, um, then vortices start to appear. If I decrease, then the vortices start to disappear. So here's the movie where the rotation rate is going to be increasing. So here, this is what happens when you increase the rotation rate. So start, you start with no vortices, then a bunch of vortices start to come in. And here's the rotation rate. Then they rearrange themselves in this hexagonal lattice pattern. And then, then there's another jump in the number of vortices as I keep on increasing the rotation rate. And again, they rearrange themselves in this hexagonal lattice pattern. And here, uh, if I now decrease the rotation rate, this is uh, the following happens. The opposite effect happens. So here's what happens. I okay. So first, there's. I first I I, I put it at 0 0.25, so some large rotation rate, and it settles to this hexagonal. And then I start to decrease it gradually, and one by one the vortices go away. Until there's no vortices left. When the rotation rate is zero. Even a single word has become as unstable and, and, it, and, it, and it goes away. Okay. So we're trying to understand the thresholds. That's one of the main motivations here. So here's the same, what I just played in the movie, but in, in pictures, rotation rate versus the number of vortices. This is increasing and then decreasing the rotation rate. So as I increase, a bunch of them that come in, and then for a while nothing happens as I keep on increasing. And then another instability happens from the boundary and more come in. And then one more, etc. And then as I decrease, one by one they disappear. So it's just like more continuum curve here when you go down. Okay. So mostly I want to talk about this red curve as we go down. So that the maximum number of vortices. Okay, so to do that, and so this is the paper, uh, this is mostly the work of my students, Xuan Xian Xie. Um, so again, there's this, this method of deriving the reduced equations for the vortex motion. Uh, and um, it looks basically like the classical vortex to vortex interaction term here. But then there's additional terms that comes from the trap. 
this this uh, parabolic trap here. Okay, and so this this is very important. That's really different than than the classical the classical vortex to vortex interaction. By the way, notice that this is like a parabolic trap. So when the the vortices are close to the center, this this ratio is one or very close to one. So it really has a big effect only when there's a lot of vortices. If there's just a few vortices, then close to the center, this is just reduces to the classical sort of case. Okay, that's basically the starting point. And uh, this shows the agreement between, uh, for, for, for like a, a few vortices between the numerics and, and this reduced formula. As you can see, the, even with like 10 vortices, the agreement is very good. Okay. And now we, we want to look at the large n limit. And again, we do this reduction where so it's a coarse grain by putting a delta function at, at each particle uh, location. And this sum turns into an integral. And then you can solve. There's a way to solve for the density, which I'm skipping. But basically, the point is you get an explicit formula for the density distribution of this, of, of this vortices. Okay, and it's subject to this integral constraint. And here you can explicitly integrate everything, and then you get an explicit relationship between n and omega. Omega is the rotation rate, n is the number of vortices. Okay. And when you plot this relationship, it turns out that there's this maximal number of n. Maximal. Oh, this is, sorry, this is, there's also the, the radius, A. A is the radius of the vortex, uh, of, the, of, of the lattice, crystal lattice. And so there is, uh, and, and, and as a function of A, this is what n looks like, and then there's this n max. Okay, so no matter what the radius is, the maximum n for a given omega is some formula that you can derive by just differentiation, and there's the formula. Okay, so that gives the maximum uh, number of vortices for a given rot rotation rate omega. And it's an explicit formula, and uh, it uh, again, this is sort of the two-dimensional calculation of density, you can do that by looking at Voronoi cells, right? And then it, uh, this, there's, and then the, the analytical prediction here, it agrees extremely well, even for a small number of, of vortices, even for like 25 vortices. And this here is because of the edge effects, it's hard to compute Voronoi cells when they're unbounded, right? So, but otherwise it works well. But what's amazing is the prediction of the, of the n maxes. That's the main thing that we're interested in. So this is a little bit busy plot. Let me explain it. So here I decrease omega and I see the number of vortices. As I decrease omega, the number of vortices goes down. Okay, and there are a bunch of curves. Let's start with this curve here, the blue one, which is the full PDE simulation. And as I decrease the omega, I track the number of vortices in each one of the snapshots, okay, and it goes down, okay. Now, this curve here, oh, sorry, this curve here is the same calculation but done for, for a reduced ODE, for the reduced ODE, okay, that, that, I sh that, that Schwanschkin shared derived. There again, it's the same thing happens when, when you decrease the omega, the, 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 if, the, the, the ODE will break down. If, um, of, if n is too large. So you have to decrease n. And that's this curve here. So it tracks pretty well the actual full numerics. And this here is a continuum limit. Of course it tracks ODE extremely well, but it also tracks the full numerics very well. There's a couple of other curves. Those are from existing literature. There's a paper by Aftalion and Du here that, that, that does a relatively good job, except that it's linear. Whereas our result is fully nonlinear. Okay, so of course this, the, the nonlinear one is better than just the <laughs> linear version. And then there's this other curve here, and that curve of, is obtained through a similar calculation, except if you don't have this term, this, this term is very important, so if you just set this term to one, <coughs> then you get this curve. That was the, the previous best known result here. So this is a very good improvement. In fact, this one is order one wrong for a large number of vortices, right? But for a small number of vortices, it works similarly. Tassim totes do the same thing. OK, so um, I'll, I think I'll stop here. A bunch more stuff.
well, let me just say one more thing is that so this reduced the uh, PDE dynamics leads to very interesting problems in swarming, right? And um, the techniques that you can use from swarming also leads to some insights in, into the PDEs. Okay, so that's the message I wanted to conclude with. Okay. Okay. All right. Andy? So Theo, can I back you up to the first part of the talk? Yep. And while you're getting there, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. So uh, uh, if you look at uh, when we're looking at the swarming problems, uh, it turns out, uh, first I want to say all oh, this is very nice. Um, what happens is that uh, you can get large densities of, of particles in two ways. So in one of them is, oh. to, uh, is to look in the catastrophic limit. Yeah. Okay, and that's the end of the paper on the on this, uh, the primer paper. The other way is to look in any limit, and to confine them with the potential. Okay. Okay. And that's actually the beginner of the primer paper. So if you go to the equation you have there, we have the exponential repulsion. Okay. Um, what you find is that in 1D, you have exponential repulsion. That's what's called the Laplace potential mm -hmm. for swarming. And then you have the minus AX term there. If you write in terms of potential, it looks like X squared. Yeah. And that example is actually done explicitly in the primer. Yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah. So in that case, you actually, the two systems are the same. Yeah, that's okay. right. But it's, you're looking at a different regime in the primer. No, no, so it's, I think. it's identical, okay, so in fact... The, the model is identical, but what's different is the, I think, is the scaling, right? You have 1 over n, so here the scaling of A is different. So, but if you look at the next <coughs> picture there, so if you look at the, um, so the 1D version that's on the left, you'll see the density thins out at the ends. Mm -hmm. So if instead of graphing, um, uh, uh, you're graphing one over you, if you, gr if you graph the density, mm -hmm. what you find is there's a parabolic profile that drops precipitously to zero at the boundaries. And you can actually compute where the boundaries are. Okay. 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 And I think you will find the solutions are identical. Oh, really? Okay. So now the interesting question is whether or not you can do this in 2D and find the solution. And I'll tell you that I started looking at that problem. It's a modified Bessel function, okay, which turns out to be the kernel of the Laplacian in 2D. Mm -hmm. That's what I have here as well. Right. So I gave up on that because the um, trying to solve the equations that come out of it are it's tedious at best. You're you know the nice thing about exponentials is things come out nicely. Mm -hmm. um, needless okay. to say working with Bessel functions requires either more persistence or perhaps more intelligence. One of, the, of those two I do not have. I'm not sure which. Okay. Or just do it numerically, right? Uh, you can do it numerically yeah. and actually so it turns out that for the case where you're looking at the catastrophic potential so you have attraction and repulsion there's a group of Germans that actually looked at that and, uh, and and worked out this problem. So one of the authors was Mueller, and I can dig out the other two authors for you. Okay. 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 Um, but um, the thing I find amazing about this is you actually go from PDE to particle system to back to PDE. And to, yeah, kind of. Uh, yeah. The, the question which I've always had about this is that for us, for looking at these systems, really what was driving it was looking at the energy. And I'm wondering whether or not there's a way to do the homogenization of the energy and get rid of looking at the particle limit for these problems. But isn't particle limit and energy the same thing? Uh, I, I, I don't think so, because in some sense you're looking at the velocity of the particles. Yeah. Okay, what would be really nice is that if you could, for each spike, okay, associate an energy per unit area with it and then minimize that energy directly. So okay. you wouldn't actually be looking at the dynamics anymore. You'd just be looking at an energy minimization problem. And I don't know if that's possible here. I actually at one point fooled around with looking for an energy in the gear meinhardt system, and it's it's not it's not there. 
Okay, so it's it's um, there certainly are systems that are for not this, variational. For this for this for this system here, it's just a single ES. There's an energy formulation, right? There's but for the for the GM, there is yeah, not so not as far as I know. Yes, yeah, so there's an energy formulation for this yeah. one. The thing that bothers me with this one is that if you just plunk a UT on it, because of the U squared term there, it's unstable. Yeah. So instead of uh, oh, yeah, looking for right. minimizers, yeah. okay, you're looking for some sort of Steady uh, saddle point. Saddle points, yeah, right. they're saddle points. And right. um, needless to say, that, well, for me, in terms of looking at this numerically, if you're looking for saddle point, all the methods we use, which are gradient and set methods, fall apart. Yeah, no, you cannot solve this. Like this is all like theoretical. This n spike solutions, yeah. but you cannot solve this like from a PDE, from numerical PDE, because it's not going to converge to to that solution. You, yeah, yeah. I, I would yeah. tend to agree with that. It's yeah. it's a hard problem. So. Yeah. But again, I I really think that I looked at the, the paper carefully, and I think that the, um, the results that we have here are like orthogonal to the ones in your paper, even though the system is the same, because of the different scaling. Like you don't get the formulas that you have, it's, it's not completely different than here. And also the lattice structure is real, the discrete lattice structure is important. You cannot just wash it out, okay? Because you're only looking at near, the nearest neighbors. So it's important that you actually look, take care that it's hexagonal, right? If it was a square lattice, you'd get a different result. Uh, you're talking yeah. about? In 2D. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we can discuss this a bit more. Okay, later. I want to make a comment that you may have a technique to solve a problem that I think is unsolved. Is that, you know this homoclinic snaking phenomena whereby it's like a wave packet type solution that's expanding mm -hmm. as you go up this ladder type structure? Yeah. An open problem is to try to figure out kind of what the domain is what that confinement radius is, right, as you go up this. So if you have a parameter oh, in the okay. model that's a bifurcation parameter that you then use to compute the, the radius of the confinement, right, so that maybe you'll be able to mm. do what only people have done kind of numerically, right? Like David Lloyd has all these pictures of kind of the, yeah. the clustering phenomena. But I, I don't know. I don't think that, like the starting point for all of this is like <coughs> the reduced system for, you know, like center interactions. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not aware if they have that in like the no, reduced system. No, but I'm saying that, they don't first of all, the question would be to derive that. Yeah, yeah, right? and that's then the, the first that, question. Oh, yeah. it's only interaction by tails at some level. But yeah. It's, uh, okay, yeah. But you oh, need that's that, interesting, right? Yeah. But there is a bifurcation parameter in the reduced dynamical description mm -hmm. that then ha goes through a succession of fold points. Oh. So okay. I'm thinking that you have a technique to, that may be hmm. to do that. Okay. But okay, that's just a comment. Okay, does anybody else have anything else to add? All right. If not, let's have our break till 11.30 and thank Theo for a wonderful talk. I just say like connections between patterns and uh, localized patterns and MF connections between patterns and MFPT. Okay, so our second talk this morning is uh, Professor Justin Zhu, who is from Macquarie University. He used to be a postdoc at UBC and at Dalhousie. Okay, so he'll talk about localized pattern formation and connections to mean first passes time optimization. All right. All right, thank you, Michael. And uh, before I start, I just want to thank uh, Michael and David for, for putting this thing together. I've, I've had a really great time, and um, it's been, re been really productive as well. Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a different talk in the sense that the final conclusion the f or, the, or the main message is not as conclusive, it's a bit more speculative. It's going to be more about like a, a report of results and some wishful thinking maybe, okay? So uh, we've seen talks now with mean first passage times, but we also saw a talk now with Theo with uh, localized patterns, right? And so what I'm going to try to do is try to maybe draw some connections between the two. All right. So. With the mean first, so I'll talk about basically the two, two separately, right? Mean first passage times and pattern, pattern formation. With um, mean first passage times, I'm going to focus more on the case with moving traps, okay? And with localized patterns, I'll talk a little bit about what types of instabilities and dynamics they undergo, right? So stuff that kind of Theo alluded to. Um, 
And then, you know, these, these two problems, they look very, very different, right? But I'm going to show how, how some of the results, they're very, very closely related. And I'm, I'm going to do this in 1, 2, and 3D. Okay, so I'm going to give an example in each of these dimensions of how these two problems are, are very intimately related. Okay, so kind of like um, kind of projecting forward a little bit, right? Where my mind is at is, so here, we saw that even when the, sta then when the traps were stationary, um, the optimization problem was not easy, right? And with moving traps, it's even, it's even harder. And so if there's a connection between these two, like wouldn't it be nice if we could kind of use the results here, right? So this is not, as, this is not so difficult, right? To say something about the very difficult problem here. Okay, so that's kind of where, where this is going. All right, and in the, in the end, I'll say something about the full distribution because it's come up a couple of times. All right? Okay, so with one dimension, so I'll start with one dimension, first passage times, an example where moving traps comes up, right? The triggering of action potentials. Okay, so here's the, the uh, potential across an excitable membrane. You can sum, okay, so the, maybe there's like a, a deterministic component as well, but there's some stochastic component maybe, right? So it, it, it triggers, it, 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 it fluctuates, and then at some point it reaches a certain threshold, and then it triggers an action potential, okay? But if you look at a series of them, what happens is that the, the, the potential at which it triggers depends on time, right? It, tr it varies from triggering to triggering. And this is due in part to external stimuli, right? And also memory from a previous triggering event, right? So what it looks like essentially is you have something that's chasing a moving, a moving trap, a moving target, right? So this is a moving target. So this is here, random motion. I'm going to focus more on the case with uh, deterministic motion, right? So random walker. And the question is, right, how does this motion affect the first passage time? All right. Okay. So it turns out, oh, whoops. It turns out that on a finite domain with reflective boundaries, so I'm going to run two videos here, but basically here's the reflective boundaries. This is going to be the random walker, right? It turns out that motion on a, on a 1D domain, right? Or a finite domain with, with reflective boundaries, motion can actually increase the average search time, okay? So here, we're assuming that you don't know where the particle starts from, so it's averaged over all starting locations, okay? So I'm going to show two videos. One, I'm going to show here. So if you, if you do the analysis, or you can do, argue by symmetry, if you don't know where the, where the, this little guy, where the random walker is going to start from, the best place to sit, if you're going to be stationary, is right in the middle, right? And so what happens is, so this guy is going to start, is going to oscillate about the middle, right? And I'm going to show, show the video. And basically what happens is that this, this guy is exploring kind of suboptimal search locations, right? So this is kind of moving slowly. And you can show that this is a worse search strategy than just staying, staying still at the center, all right? And it's, it's not so difficult to, to, to see why. However, I'm going to show this video now where the oscillations are going to be very, very fast. And when it's very fast compared relative to the random walk, right, it essentially occupies, the trap essentially occupies that entire interval at once, right? And it essentially makes itself a bigger target. And in this case, you can show that for sufficiently fast oscillations, this is the better strategy, right? So what is that minimum threshold, right? So the approach that we take is we're going to try to map, we're going to try to derive the ODE corresponding to a moving target, right? And the, and the derivation is very straightforward. It follows directly from, or it's, it's exactly analogous to, to, the, to the derivation by Redner for the stationary target, right? So this is the, um, wait a second. Did I skip the slide here? I did. Sorry about that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically map this 1D random walk to a 2D random walk with, I guess, okay, random walk in this direction and advection in this direction. So I'm going to run this video. It's the equivalent thing. So random, 1D random walk on the left, the equivalent random walk uh, in 2D on the, on the right. So we have advection in this direction. Again, we have reflective boundaries here. Right, this whole thing now um, is the absorbing kind of target or the absorbing boundary, 
right? Its shape encodes the motion of the trap in time. And because uh, we're, assuming, we're going to assume periodicity of this motion, and so we had periodicity here and here, right? So you basically have u equals 0 here, and then um, no flux conditions on the right and left, OK? And so the, the, the derivation is straightforward, right? So it follows exactly red, as, as Redner did. So this is the first passage time of the particle starting from location x. T kind of basically tells you where the trap is coming, uh, is starting its motion from, right? It's the average of the two locations it's going to be at next plus the delta t time it takes to get there. Um, this is the Dirichlet condition on this boundary, um, insulin, reflective boundary conditions, periodicity. And you get essentially, so I, I rescaled, so omega's there. So omega's the, um, the frequency of oscillation, right? So you just get this ad advection term in, in, the, in the time direction, OK? And here we, we have a trap that's oscillating about x naught. So I'm going to take x naught equals 1 half, the center of the domain, epsilon amplitude and sign and um, periodicity, peri periodic motion. Right? And this is just a typical PDE solution. So you have u equals 0 all along here. Right? So I'm taking two slices. Right? So this is uh, Monte Carlo versus PDE. So here the, the trap is at the center, but it's moving to the right. So some, a particle that starts here is going to have a lower first passage time than the one that starts in the, in the back. This is the opposite, even though the, the, the trap is still at x equals 0 0.5. Okay. So we said that uh, for. The benefit of trap motion is that it allows a larger exploration of, of, of the search region. It essentially takes up more space, right? The, the detriment is that it, it takes uh, the trap into worse search locations. So when do these effects balance? Well, it turns out that when the amplitude is small, you can, cap, you can do this asymptotically. I'm not going to do it. It's very, it's very straightforward. But essentially, we, we, we just expand the small amplitude uh, epsilon, right? And we get that the effect, of, um, the effect of the trap motion is actually at order epsilon squared. Okay, so this is u bar equals the, the mean first passage time associated with the, f the stationary target plus epsilon squared h omega. Um, this guy, so you can imagine that when omega is small, right, h is positive, and so it's going to increase MFPT. This, when omega is large, it's going to be <coughs> negative, and this is exactly what you see, right? Okay. So the thing that I want to point out here is that omega c is about 9.6, right? So it's right this number right here. OK. So let me switch gears a little bit, right? And I'm going to talk about patterns. So this is something that Theo kind of talked about earlier, right? Something similar. So this is a Gray-Scott model, right? It's the two-component activator inhibitor reaction diffusion system. Um, the thing, the, the feature here is this uh, separation of spatial scale. So epsilon squared, the, the diffusivity of the activator is much smaller than the diffusivity of the inhibitor. So the inhibitor kind of acts as the fuel, right? And it le leads to this localized pattern, OK? So this is like a spike pattern. How does this spike move? So just one thing, actually just one thing. So V here is going to be localized, yes? So V here is very localized, which means that this term here is very localized. <laughs> Forget about this U here for a second, because this guy is going to be in the limit that we we, we consider this guy is not going to be really relevant, right? So you have a uxx plus 1, which is kind of similar to what uh, the MFPT equation, right? Minus this localized sink, right? Minus this localized sink. So you can kind of see it's kind of similar, right? OK, so how does this spike move? So it's equilibrium locations at the center, so x equals 0 0.5, right? And it moves when it's to the left of that. It wants to move to the right because the, the um, Basically, it follows this, the, it goes in the direction of the steeper gradient of the fuel, right? And then, um, obviously, when it's to the right, it wants to move to the left. And so you can see that, essentially, this fuel is kind of like uh, making the spot go back to the center, right? And it does so on this time scale tau. So tau is kind of like the time scale over which, which it, re it responds to perturbations. And what happens is that when this tau gets very, very large, the inhibitor response becomes more and more sluggish, and it leads to an undershoot-overshoot kind of dynamic, right? And it triggers oscillations. So what do you see here? So this is tau below threshold. It kind of guides the spike back to the center. When it's above threshold, a Hoff bifurcation is triggered. And the, and the thing is, is that the, it oscillates at some characteristic Hopf frequency, right? And in the limit, A is very large, D is very large. 
So this U kind of goes away. The hop frequency, right, equals this. So, the, okay, so we're in slow time here. Tau is order one over epsilon squared. But this omega C, so the oscillation of slow time is exactly the same as that optimal, for, as, as that threshold frequency in the MFPT case. Okay? So you can kind of see like there's this optimization problem and the correspondence to the, to the spike dynamics. Okay? All right. So let me move on to 2D. So this is a, a typical <coughs> diagram in 2D, predator prey or, or our search and rescue, right? And the point here is that the trap is not always going to be stationary, right? I'm going to show an example here where the trap is not stationary and an, an optimization problem naturally arises. Right? All right. So here in this paper, they were trying to basically understand how to collect data from an invasive fish species in a, in a, in a lake in Minnesota. Okay? So they have, there's an invasive fish species and you want to be able to control their numbers. And what they, what they want to do to, to do that is they want to be able to track their population in time, right? And they want to understand how these fish move and where they tend to aggregate, okay? And so to do this, they implant the fish with radio tags, right? And they track the fish with radio antenna. And the antenna has to be within a certain distance of the fish in order to, to kind of collect the data, right? And they propose two strategies, right? So they, so here's the uh, so here's the lake, right? And the fish are doing all these all these uh, random random motion here. Okay. So this is the first strategy is that they put stationary uh, stationary antenna station. So this is like the, the radius of detection, right? All over the lake, and when whenever fish kind of swim by, it collects data from the fish. The other the other strategy is this: they sent, they put like a little antenna detector on a robot, right? Autonomous robot, and that robot does kind of a blind search a blind search for fish, right? So it does some kind of motion around the lake. And this is actually the one that they went with. Why? Because this, this ended up being too expensive, right? And so they actually went with this strategy here. And so the, th the thing with this is that, well, where, the, the question here is that where do you put the antenna stations in order to, to sample as many fish as possible, right? You don't want to put them all in the corner or else you're never going to see any fish, right? Here, they say, well, what is the motion? What is the optimal motion that this guy should travel on, right, to, to maximize its, in, its encounter, with the frequency of its encounter with fish, All right? And both questions are basically asking, what is the optimal strategy for minimizing first passage times to the antenna? All right. So I'm going to come back to this from a 3D perspective in a little bit later, okay? But I'm going to focus on this now. Right? So just as in the 1D case where we had to map to 2D, right? so now in 2D we have to map to 3D. So here's essentially a moving target, right? so it can change in size. Okay? So at time t equals t1 it looks like this, time t equals t2 it looks like this. It basically you, you have to map into 2D. This is like a, a borehole, you have u equals 0 all along here. Um, re reflective, reflective boundary conditions around the cylinder, periodic conditions here. Okay. And so this ends up being very, very difficult to solve. We're still working on it at the moment. Um, this is kind of like a finite elements um, schematic. So this is like the cylinder cut in half. This is that little thing that's cut out. So this is u equals zero all along here and periodic conditions here and here. So this is just a kind of clearer picture of what's going on. Okay, but this is, this is the cylinder cut in half. All right, so there is one specific case where we can stay in 2D, right? This is like the easiest case possible. Right, so I'll, I'll run this, and it's this problem here, right? So you have a Brownian particle, right? You have a, a concentrically rotating trap, right? So the key is that it's concentric, okay? And it's rotating at some, some omega, frequency omega, and a distance r not away from the origin, right? And you ask two questions. One, what is the, the, the critical rotation frequency Right above which a moving trap, a rotating trap, performs better than one that stays in, at the center, right? And for a frequency larger than that, what is the optimal radius of rotation that minimizes that uh, the, the first capture time? Okay, so averaging over all starting locations. Okay, so okay, yeah, the derivation I'm not I'm not going to go through, but essentially, we can we. We stay in the moving frame of the trap, 
and then we bias the random walk in the other direction, right? So that's, that's basically exactly what this term does. Okay, and this says that the trap is rotated, is uh, located at R, on, on the x-axis, R not away from the origin, and the size is epsilon, we're gonna take epsilon small. Okay, and the goal is to minimize this quantity here, so this is global mean first passage time. All right, by choosing the R not for any given omega. So here's the main, main result here, okay? <coughs> So the main feature I want to focus on is right here, right? This says that, f so this is omega versus R naught. For omega less than, so this is about three, right? It says that for omega less than that critical frequency, you should not rotate at all. You should stand, stand, you should sit in the center, right? It's only when you're above that you should, you should actually rotate at some non-zero frequency, okay? So there are a few different regimes. I'll go over these regimes very quickly, but this is the thing that I wanted to focus on. Okay, and I also say that this is in no way, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not claiming that this is the optimal strategy, right? Although down here, I suspect that it, it would be the, the, the optimal strategy here, okay? But we can maybe say that it's locally optimal. All right, yep. Just, uh, you say that you will speak about left part of this graph, but can you briefly mention why there is a decrease uh, at large frequencies, if I understood? So it goes up, yeah. and then there is a branch which decreases. What is the reason for the decrease? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure, right? Um, so I will say that as omega goes to infinity, for sure it's 1 over root 2, right? So that, that's... Basically, um, it splits the, uh, the disk into two, two equal areas, right? So this is kind of like the strange one, right? Because this, it, it's not monotonic, right? So this is kind of like, as, it's actually asymptotically close to one. So I'm gonna show like the analysis in this region, right? But physically, it's, it's a little bit difficult for me to explain. But you, you can see this analytically and I'll show it, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna go through the analysis kind of quickly. So this is matched asymptotics with Green's functions, right? So um, in the inner variables, we make this, this change. So this is near the target, okay? And the, um, in the inner region, we have Laplace's equation to, to leading order outside the unit disk. Solution's a log, in which case from the outer region, right, U kind of looks like a Green's function with this U bar, right? So this integral condition fixes the G uniquely, and it makes this U bar the global mean for as fast as time, all right? So G has this singular behavior, so this is the regular part, the self-interaction term. So U looks like this as, as X goes to the trap, right? We, can, we do the matching and we get U bar in terms of the regular part and the log epsilon scaling, okay? So we can, because it's a circle, we can solve for the, the regular part exactly, and this is, this is what you see, right? So you can solve this, uh, okay, so you can do this analytically, but essentially, this is, again, this is about omega equals three, okay? All right, and again, so in this regime where we're assuming that omega is much less than one over epsilon, you get that this, this guy, this, the optimal radius goes to one asymptotically as, as omega gets very large, but omega has to be much less than one over epsilon, right? So this is kind of like a little sub-regime, okay? So this is, kind of, this is kind of going to be like the funky regime here. So this is like omega very, very large, but less than one over epsilon, okay? And the solution looks like this. So this is kind of like, okay, so you can think of the Green's function as kind of being radially symmetric here and out here, right? So this is the strip that's, that's, uh, that we're going to focus on, right? So it's actually, it's, uh, G is almost constant along this, on this disk. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to find that constant and assume radial symmetry out here. Right? And that, that value is going to uniquely fi fix the G. Okay. So we do this in, term, in, all, in, in matched asymptotics, three different layers. Okay, so in the innermost layer, you have the order epsilon elliptic layer, order one over epsilon, over one over omega elliptic layer, right? And it, another parabolic layer on top of that. Okay, so the, this is kind of like the time, it smooths this guy out in this direction here. Okay. So this is only the leading order analysis. The, at the next order, you actually have to do the periodicity. I'm not gonna do that. Okay. All right, so the key is that we're gonna calculate this, this um, the leading order behavior of G, right, in the limit of large omega. All right, so 
essentially the value of g along here. All right, so in each of these layers, you can, you can compute an exact solution, okay? And then you can match them, you do the matching. So this h bar here, right? So I'm not gonna go through this, but you can solve exactly in each layer, right? And this h bar, this h bar gets fixed by the zero mean condition, okay? And so, you, so now you go like u equals, mi again, minus pi times this g, this g function, this greens function plus this u bar, right? You do the matching condition, okay? And then um, you, fix, you find this u bar here, right? And you get this very, very simple expression for u bar. You still have this log epsilon omega. So it tells you that when, when epsilon omega equals order one, you don't get the log epsilon scaling anymore. So basically that, that, that distinguished regime is omega equals one over epsilon, right? Where, where the first passage time becomes order one and not log epsilon, right? And here you can see very clearly that the, 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 optimal, frequent, the optimal radius is one. All right, so this regime I'm not gonna do so, so much, right? So um, I think I'll skip a couple slides, but essentially, again, we, we uh, exploit the radial symmetry, right? And again, we're still gonna try to compute this, this, the value of u on this ring, all right? So this is kind of the regime that connects this, this weird regime to the one over root two regime. Okay, so the main feature here I wanna say is that the inner region no longer is Laplace's equation, so you don't get the log anymore, right? You, you just get this, uh, because this, this breaks the radial symmetry, right? And at, the, at infinity, it's no longer log, it's just the constant. And this is the constant that we're gonna try to back out, okay? We make this, so this, this approach is actually um, from, from Bazant, okay? So we're gonna formulate a, 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 a boundary value problem for this mu for this mu guy here. Okay, so in the outer region, we do this linear transformation. We compute this u naught, the value that we want in terms of the flux of mu on this, on this trap. Okay, so you do this divergence theorem, right? You compute this, this, this flux in terms of the adjoint Green's function. You impose the boundary conditions. And essentially what, what you do is you, 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 um, you formulate uh, an integral equation, you solve it numerically, and um, you compute this, this u naught here. Right, and that uniquely fixes your, your u, all right? And the, the point here is that while we still do numerical computations, it becomes numerical computations on a very regular problem, all right? So no more epsilon in the problem, all right? And you, you can get the results here. So this is numerics versus asymptotics, all right? Okay, so let me move on to pattern formation now in 2D. So this is not my work, right? So this is this was work done by Theo and his graduate student, Shuang Chuan Shi, right? So this is the Schnackenberg model in, um, in 2D, right? Activator inhibitor. Um, you still have the separation of spatial scales epsilon squared. So this is a one here, right? And the key bifurcation parameter is gonna be this tau. And as you increase this tau, you, you trigger a Hopf bifurcation and uh, the mechanism is the same in, as in 1D, okay? So I'm gonna run this video. So this is again, uh, work by Shuang Chen and Theo. Okay, so what you're gonna see, so this, this is the spot, right? So this is, uh, this is V, right? So it's localized near some region. The equilibrium location is at the center, okay? And as tau increases, right, you trigger a Hopf bifurcation in the location, right? And I should mention, so while this video is running, the, the parameter regime over which this instability is a dominant instability as you increase tau is kind of small, right? But it's, it's there, okay? And okay, at some point, it's, it's gonna do some kind of rotation around, around the domain, right? And um, basically, it's, it's a saturation of the Hopf bifurcation, right? Okay, so I'm not gonna run the whole video, but it's, you'll, you'll take my word for it that it essentially saturates into a some kind of periodic orbit. All right, and the, the, th the, th the thing that I want to emphasize is that analogous to the 1D case where the Hopf bifurcation frequency was exactly equal to the threshold frequency at which um, a moving trap becomes optimal, right? This Hopf frequency is, a is exactly the same, okay, in slow time as the, uh, the critical frequency above which the rotating trap becomes more optimal than one that stays at the center, 
Okay, and more, more than that, right? So this amplitude R naught at which the rotation saturates is an increasing function of how far above tau you set the threshold, right? So this is tau naught, right? And this is the the um, the rotation frequency. So, the, oh, sorry, the, the rotation radius. So it's not always going to be stable, right? So the, the circular orbit is not always going to be stable, but you but it's predicted that so it follows some kind of um, uh, so this R naught versus tau, okay? So this is the tau, the, the, um, the Hoff bifurcation threshold, right? And for each rotation radius, there's a unique associated rotation of, uh, frequency of rotation. And that radius versus rotation frequency relationship, right, is exactly given by this relationship. Okay, so you can see this very intimate, um, intimate relationship between, right, this, this, uh, the, the, the dynamics of a spot and the, the, uh, the, um, the optimization problem for the, for the MFPT, right? And again, you might think, wh wh what you might think is that, well, um, couldn't I, wouldn't it be great if I could use these results to say something about the optimization problem here, right? Because this is, so on a circle, it's very easy. On, a reg on, a, on, a, on any kind of arbitrary domain or even like a torus, right? This, this would be a very difficult problem to solve, okay? So I just want to say something quickly about two traps, right? So you can do the whole thing again for two traps, right? So this is two traps co-rotating around the domain, right? So just the presentation results. So this is omega less than between zero and 14. So these numbers, they don't change so much in epsilon. Okay, so epsilon being the size of the trap. So here you have two traps that are um, on rotating on the same circle, right? Same circle and um, pi phase apart. So as when you pass about omega equals 14, very suddenly you get like the, the optimal strategy would be rotating on two different circles, right? In exactly in phase. So this is exactly in phase and it happens as a jump, okay? And as you go, f uh, as in omega increases a bit more, this is the optimal strategy and at omega equals infinity, it does this, okay? All right, so optimize, optimizing cooperation between two traps becomes quite a bit more difficult. And again, wouldn't it be great if we could look at hop bifurcation with two spots or n spots, right? And maybe that will that'll tell us something about the optimal strategy for, for n, for n uh, traps. All right, okay, so let me move on to 3D. Right, so the, okay, I'm, I'm kind of cheating a little bit. So these are 1D patterns, but these are, these are actual 3D patterns. These are foot, kind of football-shaped patterns. Okay, so these are rock patterns that are found in Northwest Australia. This is from Anya Slim. So these are regions where uh, you have high concentrations of oxidized iron, whereas these white regions, are, they're devoid of that, and they were rich in hydrogen irons, basically, inhibitor, right? So, they're trying to formulate a, uh, an activator inhibitor uh, model for, the, for this um, type of, type of uh, pattern. Okay, so these are patterns in a belisov jabotinsky reaction, right? So legitimate 3D patterns. So you have spots, uh, tube patterns. So these are tubes, right? So these are kind of sheet patterns, okay? Um, and this is, actu this is actual data, like this is not just uh, computations, right? So I'm going to focus on these uh, spot patterns here very, very quickly. All right, so again, we're looking at the Schnackenberg, and this kind of came up a little bit, um, I think, earlier in the week when Sean asked about, well, what happens when you go from 2D to 3D, right? The Green's function decays as 1 over R in 3D, and so the interaction between the spots is quite a bit weaker and you need a, a, a stronger diffusion coefficient to, to mediate that, that interaction, okay? <coughs> so what I'm gonna do is very quickly, right, um, go over the construction of this, this equilibrium solution. I'm gonna show two nonlinear events, kind of what Theo did with self-replication annihilation, right? And uh, so I think I might, I might skip the derivation of this a little bit, right, but let's go. So these are typical spot patterns. So V is very localized in these, um, these spots and then zero everywhere else, right? So again, we do a matched asymptotics approach, inner region, outer region, right? So to leading order, the spots are radially symmetric, right? So we get this inner problem. 
The key is that you have to compute this mu j. You cannot specify these, these separately, right? You have to compute mu j versus sj. So you have to do this part numerically, right? So this sj, you do this divergence theorem, it's essentially the strength of this reaction term, okay? And the key is to compute this mu j versus sj. All right, so I'm not gonna say too much here. So this is a spot profile. As s gets very large, or as s gets sufficiently large, you see that there's a dimple, right? And it's kind of a precursor to the splitting event, and I'll show that in a second. Okay. So as far as the outer region goes, again, you see that this V is localized. This Laplace use of, pretend that this is the one for, for a minute, right? So you get Laplace, so forget about this D, Laplace U plus one equals minus some localized source, right? So again, you can kind of see the analog with the, with the MFPT problem, right? So, he's, um, so we're going to replace this term by weighted delta function, right? And uh, so you do all this stuff. And the outer region, then uh, the equation is just then this. So again, it's just localized sinks. Laplace u plus some constant equals some localized sinks, right? So you see the, the analog. All right. So there's two possible types of instabilities that happen on an order one time scale, right? The competition stability where, okay, so wait, wait a second. So this A here, right, that's kind of the fuel influx, and it's what sustains these spots. And when A gets very, very small, right, there's not enough fuel, spots tend to die. And when A gets large, there's, there's enough fuel to sustain more spots, the spots tend to split. All right. So competition stability, there's a competition for resources. This only happens for N greater than or equal to two. Spots annihilate, self-replication, the opposite. When A gets large, they split. So I'll run these videos. Okay. And the thing that I want to emphasize is that, so, okay, so you can see the splitting. Um, after they split, you can see that they kind of rearrange themselves into an equilibrium configuration before they split, right? They get killed. Oh, sorry, 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 right, right, right. They, they, right, right. So this is the, uh, the, the, um, the annihilation one, right? Thanks. So when e after each one dies, right? So they, they move, they drift, and it happens on an epsilon cube time scale. Okay. Oh, whoops. Sorry about this. Um, so I, I want to maximize. Um, so I, I was trying to do that. Com oh, right. Sorry, it's command, command L. So I was doing comma L. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So competition instability. Is there a way to advance this slide? There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is the opposite. So you start with um, start with one spot, right? So you A, A, we're, we're jacking up A here. So when it reaches a certain threshold, these guys split. And again, you see that after they split, they, they drift into another equilibrium uh, configuration before the next splitting event. So I'm going to kind of skip this a little bit, right? So the key, the point is that these spots, they're, they're self, they're self, uh, they're mutually rep repelling and they also repel from the boundary as well. Okay. So that's, that's basically what causes the, um, the motion. So I'm going to skip this. Essentially it's like a, a solvability condition at, at, um, at infinity. So you do this. The point is that, um, that dxj, so xj is a spot, is, is the spot location, right? So here's the thing. So dxj by dt equals epsilon cubed, so that's the time scale over which the, 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 the spots drift, is sj, so sj weighted gradient terms, okay? So these are a whole bunch of gradient terms. And these sj's, the key is that they depend weakly on the spot locations. 
And so SJ is essentially just some, const, some, some um, <coughs> common value between all the spots, right? And so to leading order, it just becomes a gradient flow, right? It flows downhill on this, on this energy H, okay? And as Michael said earlier, right, and earlier this week, this guy has a whole bunch of multiple, uh, multiple local minima, okay? And so, so the, the optimization is not, is not that simple, even for, for small n. Okay. So each, each of these local minima then, right, they represent a stable equilibrium configuration for the spots, right? And the, this, com this, this kind of energy or, or potential comes up in a, in a very different place, right? So suppose that you wanted to, so as, as uh, that, that uh, example I was showing you where you had antenna, you wanted to place it in optimal configurations, right? So if you want to do that in 3D, you want to, you want to put these, um, these, these traps at locations for which this guy is minimized, okay? So again, you see that this, the, this connection between the dynamics of the spots and an optimization problem for the MFPT problem, all right? Okay, so that, that's that. All, all I want to say now is something about the full distribution, right? So is the global MFPT the best thing to, to minimize or is, is it the most representative of the, of the process that you're looking at, right? So this is, a, so this is a, the first passage time density associated with a rotating trap, okay? So I have a rotating trap here a particle starts here, a random walker starts here, right? So very likely it's just gonna hit this guy immediately, right? So that's this spike here, right? It goes around once and probably, the, so this is the next one, next time around, next time around, next time around. The global mean first passage time here is gonna be U, U bars like some number 3.7. I mean, is it, uh, because here it looks like R and G basically describe a kind of an interaction, but it's a pairwise interaction. So uh, is it, I mean, you should also have some three-body interaction or, or more. So is this a kind of a, a approximation that you do or, or how, 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 how do you get this R and G? So or these or G why do you have only pairwise interaction? Why do you only have pairwise? Yes. Because this is a disorder what you get. If you want to go to the uh, next order, the ah, okay. Ah, okay. So you get them. Okay. The ah, okay. Okay. So, 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 so it's, it's, a f it's just it's a leading... It corresponds in the mid first passage time to the O or one. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, so okay, this is okay. going to be a leading order, okay, right? Okay. So there's, there's higher order terms that I, that I throw ah, away. Okay, okay, that you okay. throw out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're uh, right. So here, this number is is not so is not so informative when you're dealing with some with some kind of distribution that looks like this, right? And so even in the case when you have a uh, just a stationary spot or stationary trap, it's it's kind of the same thing, right? So you have some global mean first passage time that's averaging over all starting locations. Right, so if I have one that starts here, so this is a trap, right, it looks like this. If I move it just a little bit, it, it looks very, very different, right? And so just to elucidate this a bit more, right, to leading order, the, 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 um, the standard deviation, right, of this distribution is order one over nu plus some order one constant, but this order one depends on the location of the trap, right? It's, it's at order, only at order nu, so nu is order as, uh, as minus one of log epsilon. It's only at order nu where the starting location comes in, right? So what, what this means is that even if you start very close to the trap, it's very possible that you take a very long sojourn before you find the trap again, okay? So the full density is, is kind of a valuable thing here to, 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 to look at instead of just this one, one number that averages over all starting locations, okay? And so, as has been said before, you now have to deal with a full diffusion equation, right? So, survival probability, full density is just the derivative. So, the global mean first passage time, it, it averages over time and also space, right? So, you're averaging out a lot of information. 
So, um, so I think as Dennis said earlier this week, we're going to take the Laplace transform this guy, right, to, to turn it into an elliptic problem on which we have machinery to, to, to solve. Okay. All right. So this is now the Laplace transform equation. This delta function comes from the, the initial condition. So this is like the, the initial location of the random walker, right? So just as in just as before, each trap gets represented as 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 kind of a delta function, right? So u is just a linear combination of Helmholtz Green's functions now, right? So this guy is from this, and then one for each of the each of the traps, all right? So the, here's the Helmholtz Green's functions. This is the, as an aside. If you integrate across, right? So we have um, no flux boundary conditions. You get s times the integral of g is is minus one. So g the integral of g is one over s. Okay. So the key here is that you need to, sorry, we need to compute all these, all these different weights, right? One for, each, one for each trap, right? We do that by matching. We get an n by n system for these aj's, and then we get, uh, and then you integrate across, right? So you use the fact that integral of g is one over s, you get this, so this is the capture time density, okay? So the key is we need to compute this g, right? And for arbitrary s, we, we would need a finite element solver, basically, right? The, the special regime where you can look at it analytically is for large s, or small time, right? And in this case, you actually have to resolve exponentially small terms. This is where numerics is not so great, right? But here, so Theo and Michael did this problem a while back, right? You decompose this g into a regular part and a singular part, right? So this v is, I think it's going to be the Bessel function, the free space Green's function, right? And you do a boundary integral formula for this regular part, okay? And you do it. Uh, you, you can do it a boundary layer expansion, and this works for any arbitrary smooth domain in R two, okay? And from here, you can do this whole thing analytically modulo the, the inverse, which you do in the inverse Laplace transform, which you ha you have to do numerically, right? So you can do this for so we did this for an ellipse, but this is just for a circle, right? You have a starting, lo starting location here, a trap here, and then five here. Right, and this is what leads to this multimodal distribution. Right, so it hits this, hits this one first. So this is that peak, and then hits another one. It's that that peak there. Okay, so without any kind of numerics except for that inverse Laplace, right, we can capture a very very uh, important part of this, this this distribution. Okay, so that's it. So as far as future work, right. So as I said earlier, right, we saw that there was this kind of correspondence between the dynamics of the spots and the, 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 um, the optimization problem for the MFPT, right? And so to what extent can we, can we use this easier problem of the spot dynamics to say something about the very difficult, pro difficult problem of the MFPT optimization, okay? And so here are some steps that we would have to do, but essentially, right, so how do you do it maybe on different, different <coughs> surfaces, different arbitrary domains, right? And uh, I think I'll stop there. So th thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for a great talk. Let's okay. Dennis. Uh, thank you very much, a really interesting talk. Thank you. I have uh, two questions. Well, first you mentioned that uh, it's often uh, distribution, it's much more valuable. Right. Do you do you see how can you formulate some optimization problem problem with respect to distribution? Yes. Is there is a standard ways to do that? You would have to somehow like you would have to first of all you would have to decide you know what you want to optimize yeah. right? Do you want to maybe you want to optimize what the the, the mode let's mm -hmm. say right? Okay. So you would kind of have to pick off this mode somehow right? And that yeah. that's that's not so easy right? Because mm -hmm. I mean we, we, okay so mm -hmm. unless this mode was somehow small. Uh, at small time, right? Then, then maybe there's some analysis you can do. But if this mode was just at order one time, maybe it's not so easy, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you would have to figure out. Yeah, so I've, that's a good question, right? You maybe figure out what what quantity you, got, you you need to optimize, right? Okay. Okay, but uh, yeah. And, and second question. Uh, so so here you studied the the period, periodic motion of of the trap or the target, mm -hmm. but I would say that if it just makes some random motion, that it would uh, speed up the search. And faster it moves, the faster you would find. So would it be the, most e the easiest way to, 
to deal with the problem. Oh, okay. Um, so what? Maybe let me go back to 1D, right? Remember, yeah, I, had, 1D, I, I had the the uh, oscillating trap in 1D, right? Yeah, yeah. But even if it was a random motion of the of the um, of the of the uh, the trap yes. in 1D, it's still actually suboptimal to to for that thing to move, unless it was diffusing at, at some at some optimal at at some uh, threshold diffusivity. Really? Yeah. So you can okay. show that actually. So we, we did that problem. Uh, we I didn't present it here because I, I wanted to do deterministic, but mm -hmm. even with a diffusing trap uh, in one D, mm -hmm. right? It, uh, it it's it can be worse than a stationary trap. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about uh, maybe some of the early slides where you uh, you're. I mean, it's kind of a theme throughout the talk, but you're comparing um, the you know, the mean first passage time problem and right. the uh, reaction diffusion problem. Right. And you you point maybe you want maybe could you go back to uh, probably maybe the third slide or something. Um, okay, I'm going to do this the uh, the long way here. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, sorry, a little bit further, f more f forward in the... Yeah, okay, yeah. there. So, yeah. and you're, you point out how the, how the U equation is, is similar in form to the... Sure. So, I mean, when I look at it, the way I think of it, I mean, have you thought about the following? So if, if, if you wrote down the Fokker-Planck equation for the diffusing particle, okay, and instead of having a, the the model where you impose a boundary condition on the trap and you perfectly absorb when you get there, if you employ what I think sometimes called the DOI model, where the, uh, you put the term in the PDE so that it's assumed that the particle diffuses, when it's in that epsilon ball, it's killed at some rate. Okay. At some, some finite rate. And so, that, so what, what it would look like is it looked exactly like that U equation, except for the you wouldn't have the v squared there. So you'd have, you'd have minus u over, you know, minus u times the, the killing rate. So it, it, oh, I mean, it's, kind of like a de it's kind of like a death rate. Yeah, that's right. So, it's, it's a, it might be, I mean, that might be, and there's, and there's uh, people have looked into um, when, that, when the model, when that, I guess, so-called DOI model is equivalent. So when it's equivalent to having a small hole that you get killed at some fast rate when you're there, when sure. that's equivalent to having a perfectly absorbing boundary. So, quick, quick question: um, If you have it in the PDE, um, how do you get it to, to basically only die in, in a certain small region? Is is, yeah, is there like you, a multiplier on the U? Which yeah, you is put localized? you put some you put some I see, indicator I see. function. Yeah, I see, I see. So that's that's basically the rule of this V then, right? I see, because oh, right, because V is only concentrated in. That's that. right. That's okay. right. Yeah. So there might be something there to to, to dig out. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, let me make a comment on that. Yeah, they're all Sorry, actually all the same, right? The That's UV right. squared, where it's just a, it's just a regular, it just introduces a multiple times a Dirac, and the outer yeah. problem is the one that determines the, the frequency. So, sorry, I'm just. Throw that yeah. So, uh, very interesting uh, result. Um, have you thought about the uh, case where? You add a drift. I, I, you I, add a I drift, add drift. Yeah. to the diffusion process, and so so in that case, the drift can lead to the rotation. I mean, you can have a system that basically that's right, yeah, rotate. Yeah. And then, indeed, um, you don't have necessarily to put you no know, the the. The, the trap that are uh, moving because if you have a drift where everything moves by diffusion, uh, you can fix the yep. the trap. You, you go into the rotating frame. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Have you tried to compare this situation with yours? I mean, have you thought about it, or have you have you? I, I have. So, uh, with what you say, so let's say that I have diffusion on on just a circle, not not the interior, right? Well, so okay. Let, I mean, let, we could be more precise. For example, you can take a dynamical system with a focus, 
Okay. Yeah, or, or just like rotation around the circle. Right, right. And then indeed have a trap somewhere. Yeah. So yep. things are coming then periodically. For sure, yeah. So that whatever, ro whatever frequency you rotate at, it's better than just staying still in, in that case because there's, there's no optimal location anymore, right? So rotation is symmetric, right? Mm -hmm. And so their motion is, is, is optimal no matter what. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. This is. I mean, this is interesting because many years ago, f for um, a question related to neuroscience up and down state that that you you presented, we, we completely by by chance found that you could have this rotation. The focus instead of l let's suppose you have a disc and you have a focus at the center, where everything is attracted. And now instead of having the, 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 this focus exactly at the center, you move this focus close to the boundary. Close to the boundary. That is, you are going to be attracted by making rotation, but, but this is not at the center of the disk. This is very close to the absorbing boundary. And then indeed, we could found that if, I mean, every, suppose everything is absorbing, but indeed, but in effect, the boundary is not, the particle is not going to escape everywhere. It's going to escape just very close to the boundary. And in effect, it's like a narrow escape problem because the probability to escape anywhere else is going to be zero. And then indeed, um, we could find like, like some kind of, 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 of uh, these um, peaks that you obtain in the time regime, you say, you, you, that you found. You, f you have these yeah, yeah. Uh, oscillations. And in that case, this oscillation, I mean, if we wanted to understand the peak of this oscillation, they were related to the spectrum of a non self joint operator. Okay. You know, to have the peaks in the, uh, uh, that, that you, you, you had. Wh which peaks? You showed these peaks uh, in the, uh, in the probability. In the moving trap. The, the moving, moving, moving trap. trap. You had this peak depending the on the. Peaks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the full distribution. Of yeah, the that's right. Okay, yeah. That's right. So we had no idea why, I mean, why everything ca came in that direction. So maybe I thought that in, in this case, because the peaks here are related basically to the omega, to the uh, frequency, right? That's right, that's right, yeah. So each time around it, so you, you can imagine basically. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, okay, sure. Okay. They're exactly re related exactly, to yeah, this. Yeah. And that in our case, it was related to a combination. I mean, maybe this is a question for you to explore. In, that, in our case, it was related to the integral of the field along the, uh, the boundary. So by, by adding, by putting a vector field in your system, ju not just by Brownian motion, this may lead to a more complicated picture that would be possibly interesting to study. This is... Uh, I see, I see. So like a bias comment. diffusion, you mean? Well, it, or even if when, when a drift is added, suppose, right, suppose right. here you explode pure diffusion. Yeah. But yeah. suppose you have a drift, you, have a, you escape from an attractor. Right, right. Where you can have a different distribution. Then, then the location of the absorbing source might be very dependent on this kind of, of uh, deterministic dynamics. That would be interesting okay, to explore. Okay. So I, I can give you, you know, more example, but, but I mean, precise yes. example. Okay, sure, sure. Um, I'm having trouble uh, understanding the problem that you're describing, but um, maybe you could... Just add a drift, x dot equal b of x, plus okay. your noise. Okay, okay, in, in the diffusion equation. In the diffusion equation. Yeah, yeah. Put okay. your absorbing patch that is moving. Right. But what, what, is, what could be the optimal, for example, suppose the fish, your fish example, there is a stream. Fish are yeah. in the ocean, there are stream every, I mean, it's not that they are swimming, uh, the water is not, is not static. They are usually, you know, the stream that can yeah. move and can make patterns. Right, right. How do you account for that? Yeah, okay, so you, you, you had a drift term. But, so, we're in this, we're, we're in this, um, the, uh, this, the frame of the, of the trap anyways, right? So we're already biasing the, the diffusion and, in, and we're in the stationary frame of the, of the trap, right? So we, we do have a, a bias diffusion. And so are you saying that we just add another, another bias to account for the actual diffusion of, for example, the fish? Yeah, and you can also see, think about the fish are not just broiling particles. 
Oh, I, I, yeah, that's and right. They are actually shooting. With, okay, we okay. have this similar problem with spermatozoa. How do you model spermatozoa? People say just do brilliant motion. No, they are not doing brilliant motion. I understand, I they understand. And, it's, and instead of having log of, of 1 over epsilon in dimension 2, it's 1 over epsilon. It's time to go to a smaller when you shoot. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Let me make a quick comment. What I find really interesting is that in inverting the Laplace transform to find the full probability distribution, you can get a good part of the early description just by taking the large S and doing the interaction with the boundary. That's right. That's right. So what that corresponds to, does that correspond to basically like the diffusive wave first whacking off the boundary and then being reflected in? Do you, do you give it that interpretation? That's right, because it, it's it's all around the boundary, right? It's all um, around the boundary, so that's it basically right, that's is right. that boundary layer for large S, so the diffusive wave bounces off the boundary, comes in, and that is enough that you need to be able to essentially get the first peak. Okay. Um, Can I think of it like that? So that is the, that's the correction, right? There's the free space greens function. Yes, that's yes, basically, yes. So that goes straight to the yes. right, and then the one that the correction is bouncing off yeah. the boundary and then going exactly. there. Yeah, and that, right. that is enough yeah. almost information to get the first peak. The of short the time it is. Yeah. So then right. I think you can solve Andy's problem from earlier this week of just making a comment about the time-dependent diffusive capture of a flux of particles hitting the sphere with all these different traps, right? Because there you can use the same type of technique with the large S approximation, right, right, right? In order to do the do the inversion to presumably get the first peak. Oh, you're, so you're saying um, you can certainly get the short time dynamics. Yeah, oh yeah, so you get the short time, and maybe you get the first peak that you had, but for an arbitrary number of these guys, uh, I can believe that. And actually, the reason why I believe that is a long story which I should tell you about, but not not here. Okay. Um, but that's actually quite interesting. So you, th you think you can actually get... Um, because you essentially need the first... I'll get this you need the first large S behavior, which you can then calculate explicitly. Because you'll be interested in the approximation of how the... Diff the, the stuff on one trap affects the other one, and it will correspond to the first time that the signal meets the other trap. And that's the large S behavior. So you can do exactly what he did, I think. All right, I'm going to shut up, right? But, okay, I think you can do that problem. All right, any other questions? No, okay, so thank you very much Thanks, for, Michael. for the talk. Thank you. And just as a little note, everybody should have gotten the information about dinner tonight. If you look, the, the written map is on here, but she also sent that information out. But Claire is giving a talk this afternoon at 3 o'clock, so we cannot forget that. Okay. Pardon me. Application to multiscale modeling of vesicular release. Please, Claire. So thank you very much, uh, Michael and David, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to meet as many people in asymptotics. And uh, Pisa is a very nice city as well, so I'm really enjoying my time here. So my my talk uh, is going to be um, okay. This workshop is about asymptotic advance, asymptotic of PDEs and application. So my talk is going to be about asymptotic and uh, a lot about application. So uh, I hope you're gonna still enjoy it. So <coughs> first, um, let's, I wanted to start with an introduction of the mean first passage time, but after one or two talks here, I realized that it was not probably very interesting. So let's start with the motivation of the problem, which is more uh, biological based. So what's the question? I'm trying to answer. So um, some of you might know that, but in the, in the brain we have neurons and neurons communicate with synapses. And how do those synapses work? So the idea is that you have the presynaptic neuron sending the information, communicating with the postsynaptic neuron, receiving the postsynaptic part of the neuron, receiving the information. And here you can see a small sketch with the presynaptic part and the postsynaptic part. What's happening? You have an action potential, which is a difference of potential between the outside and the inside that is traveling along the membrane, arriving at this presynaptic terminal. And 
this difference of potential is going to be sensed by calcium channels that are here. Those calcium channels are going to open and calcium ions are going to enter. Those calcium ions, let's say, they diffuse <coughs> and they, are gonna, they have to reach specific receptors that are located at uh, what we call duct uh, vesicles, which are the vesicles that are already opposed to the membrane. And once enough of those calcium ions can find those specific receptors, then they're going to trigger the fusion of the two membrane and um, the liberation of trans neurotransmitter within the synaptic cleft that David talked about earlier. And if those uh, neurotransmitter can find the specific receptors on the postsynaptic part, then you can trigger mechanical cascade and maybe something's going to happen in the postsynaptic neuron. So um, this is a pretty complex um, pathway to activate the presynaptic part. And what we can, what we know here is few, s few things going from biology. First, we know that the voltage-gated calcium channel are located like close to the vesicle not too far. We don't know exactly where they are because it's sub-diffusion limit, but they are cl somewhere close. And we know that at the membrane, uh, the synaptic vesicle is docked using some complex of proteins, and that this, the, the calcium has to bind on those complex of protein. Uh, it has been es per, um, um, estimated experimentally that you need like four to eight calcium to bind on this structure and then this structure is going to open through the conformational change of proteins and then the membrane is going to fuse. So why, okay, why is this important? Um, maybe you know that uh, synapses are plastic which means that they have kind of memory of what happened before and then next uh, the response to next stimulus is going to be uh, different depending on what was before, okay? And it's this phenomenon is called synaptic plasticity and both the, the, the short-term synaptic plasticity that I'm going to talk today and the long-term synaptic plasticity are supposed to play a huge role in uh, learning and memory, organization of the brain, growing of the developmental brain, etc., etc. So for example, here we have a very classic example of two um, type of cells, the climbing fiber neurons and the parallel fiber neurons. So they both project to the same Purkinje cell that is a huge neuron. And what are those specific two always cited and interesting? Because they show very different behavior if you apply two stimulus that are close in time. Okay, so the climbing fiber is projecting on the Purkinje cell and it has a very high release probability. If you have one spike, then you have a high release probability. But if, if, you, if you just stimulate the cell very just soon after, you're going to have a lower response, which is called depression. The parallel fiber uh, is also projecting on the Purkinje cell there and it's the, the opposite. So the first spike, it's usually get, you usually get a very small response, but if you just get a second, a second stimulus right after, you're going to get a much higher response, which is synaptic facilitation. Okay, synapses are diverse, neurons are diverse. Why is this interesting? It's because um, the physiological uh, data we have on those neurons are pretty similar. They have the same number of duct vesicles, they have uh, the same size of the active zone, they are approximately the same size and they are projecting on the same neuron and you can have like behaviors that are extremely different. And when we know that uh, long-term facilitation and depression are related to memory or lack of memory, you understand that we want to understand why, what is shaping such, such uh, behaviors, what is responsible for facilitation and depression at the presynaptic terminal. Um, one very well-known uh, hypothesis um, is that the facilitation to this one, when you get bigger, is due to the fact that, okay, you have the first pulse entering and then you have plenty of calcium in your terminal, okay? And then when the second pulse is gonna come, you have twice many calcium. So it's gonna activate twice much vesicle. Okay. This is, you, you find this, uh, it's like one of the common hypotheses explaining why you would have facilitation. I was not that convinced 
by this hypothesis because I was like, yeah, but the calcium, they have to find the, the, the receptors. And there's somewhere like, there is something weird here. Like, can we investigate what's happening? Can we know what, can, what could cause facilitation or not? What are the main parameters of this, et cetera, et cetera. So this was motivating uh, this modeling. Um, so let's stop with biology for a while. So let's look at the narrow escape problem at a cusp. So I wanted to tell you this story about facilitation and depression because I wanted to motivate why we are interested in this geometry. Okay? Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. So I'm going to represent calcium ions by a Brownian particle, even though they are charged ions. We're going to neglect this here. And the duct vesicle are simply a sphere that is going to be tangent to, let's say, a plan. Okay? And the binding on the snare complex, so for sure the snare complex is complex of protein, then you have binding sites, and the ions have to arrive to a binding site. But anyway, <coughs> this Brownian assumption about the particle doesn't make any sense if you start to reach very close to those C2 domains, right? So let's simplify this and consider that you bind if you close enough to the region, okay? So I would represent the binding by this ribbon that is joining the two tangent spheres. And I'm saying like, okay, if I'm close enough, let's say I'm gonna be trapped. And this is what's gonna be binding for me here. Oh, I have this. Yeah. So quickly, for those who don't know, which I'm not sure are here in this room, uh, the narrow escape problem in a cusp. So we just take a Brownian particle de uh, described by a stochastic equation, and we consider the first time to exit the domain E omega, <coughs> omega through the small o hole that is represented by this ribbon. Okay, uh, this is the formulation, and we know that the mean for passage time u, which is the um, mean of t of x, is going to be the solution of the mixed boundary value problem uh, here. So I'm uh, reflected everywhere on the blue sphere and the green sphere, and I am absorbing, ad, uh, absorbed at the red cylinder, okay? And the assumption that holds here is that uh, the surface of the cylinder has to be very small in front of the surface of all the rest of the domain. So um, here I'm in uh, 3D. But I'm going to reduce to two dimension because for sure I have this cylindrical uh, rot rotational symmetry that, is, uh, that I should take into account that's going to simplify my problem. So simply I can project into uh, theta equal zero or whatever and then I'm going to end up with this geometry. Okay? So this geometry I have that the, the, the in this geometry I'm just going to consider that the, the height of my ribbon that is now a segment is going to be my small parameter and that uh, I have done two half sphere. So as you can see, if you simply write down the, the Laplacian in uh, cylindrical coordinates, uh, and then you consider that in theta it's uh, non, there is no variation, you're going to end up with this 2D equation where the term uh, in the radial that is added by the cylindrical coordinates is going to represent the kind of drift. Okay. So I end up with a, a 2D problem with a drift in such geometry. So now uh, the thing is, how should I solve or find at least an estimate or an asymptotic analysis of this, this part? Um, I have no idea what the Green's function is supposed to be here, and there is probably no way uh, I'm going to be able to find it. So what should I do? Um, David had a paper already about uh, the funeral he showed you in his talk about this, and he was using conformal mapping. So I was like, okay, let's do conformal mapping. What was the idea of David, David when he did his conformal mapping? He found a, a map that was mapping uh, this, his 2D domain into a banana shape that was very thin, order of epsilon. And then because he could show or see that the variation of the solution in epsilon was very small, he could kind of represent his, uh, his data as 1D. And then 1D, we, we can do stuff, right? We almost get there. Um, so 
the, 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 the idea here was to use the same technique. So I have to desingularize this singularity for sure, because otherwise I'm never going to be able to do anything. But I also have to find a map where I'm going to be able to work at least 1D. Otherwise, I'm going to be stuck because a 2D problem is never going to work. So it took me some time to, to find the map. And the thing is, it's, it's just once you found the map, it's extremely easy. <laughs> Okay, but finding the map that took me some some time. So, and then I'm going to show you, and you're going to be like, "Oh, this is so easy that it's not even worth it to mention it." But, okay, what was my idea? My idea was like here, it's probably going to be constant, right? This is the results on mean for the past time. If you're far from the hole, it's going to be constant. It's even worse for a cusp. No problem about that. So, what's going to matter is what's happening here at the cusp. Okay. Um, but when I'm at the cusp, actually, the time, if I'm here, here, or here, or here, they are not going to be constant. But what's going to matter say, uh, is how far I am on the circle. So I might have something that is going to be constant on those circles. So I should transform those circles into lines, and then I'm going to have something that should be constant, right? Kind of. So this is what I did with a very simple conformal transformation, one of a z, and then you end up with this domain that for sure is very, very elongated, right? Because R a is uh, square root of epsilon. But on those lines, at least here, because here is another story, but I expect these two at the first order to be constant, so let's say it's going to be fine. At least here, I should be constant on each uh, of other lines, okay? The closer I am to the hole, it's going to change, but not on the lines. And this actually is true, and it worked well, and this was our way to, my way to, to solve this problem asymptotically. So you simply rewrite the equation using the conformal mapping, and then it's uh, the classical way to do um, <coughs> matching asymptotics. You just uh, rescale close to the hole. Okay, you see I'm rescaling S square root of epsilon, which means I'm taking a look at what's happening here. And then I'm expanding the solution. And I got the first order that is this one that I can very easily um, solve. And I got this one using boundary uh, conditions at the whole. So I know that the solution is independent in T, which is exactly what I was looking for. So I can just use this equation now, which is going to simplify very well because I have no T anymore. And then I solve using boundary conditions again at the whole, and I end up with this solution for y0, which is the first order term. Okay, where this represents like the behavior of the solution close to the whole. Uh, so the, the work is almost done. I just have to find A, which is the matching. So I already know that A is going to be constant, which is what I expect. So the, the one very uh, classical method, I think, to find A is to use divergence theorem. And then I can simply finish the calculation and find A. And then I got the leading order term of the mean first passage time that is going to be this one. OK, so here is the behavior. Like the, the, the shape of the behavior close to the hole in the cusp, and then here I'm in the image domain, right? So straight. And this is going to be uh, the leading order term far from the hole. So this is exactly what I get in the end. Um, just to check with Brownian simulation, I did the 2D and the 3D. And you see it's matching very well. We don't even see the difference <coughs> between the um, fitted curve and the analysis. And here you can see the shape of the solution, where in the boundary layer it's going to be extremely steep, as uh, people have already seen, I guess, when you're doing simulations. And then when uh, you are far away from the boundary layer, you end up with a constant solution. OK, so uh, just quickly to compare with what has been done before. Um, for the small hole in the sphere, we all know the results. That is in 1 over a, when the, the, the size, the surface of the sphere, of the, of the hole is in the a square. This is David's work. So we had uh, a mean first passage time in a at the power 3 over 2, where the surface was in a square. And what we see here is that I have something in 1 over epsilon when my surface is in epsilon at the power 3 and a half. So like, it looks like 
the, 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 the surface is not enough this, to tell us uh, what's the influence of the geometry on the mean first passage time. <coughs> okay, so we have to redo it for probably every surface. It's kind of the observable surface by the Brownian. I don't know. It's uh, so yeah. It's a, it's a I think an inter interesting result to look at. Okay, uh, but. So I know I found this. It's in one over epsilon, which means that if epsilon is small, this time it's going to be big, which means that my calcium ions will take really a lot of time to come back, right? Uh, if we go back at the first problem, what do we, what did we want it to, to, to look at? So here you see electron microscopy section of this uh, climbing fiber to Perkins cell. This is the presynaptic terminal, and this is the postsynaptic terminal, and this is the astrocyte, it's a glial cell, for those who are used to this. So you see it's, it's extremely packed here. But what we can see is this active zone where you have very dark um, part here that represents the postsynaptic part where you have all the receptors and the machinery and then the presynaptic part here and I don't know if you can see but we have like vesicles everywhere are posed. So what we want is not just like the arrival time to one vesicle, is the arrival time to this active zone. Okay, So it's a bit more complicated than what I had. Um, the other thing is that the, the calcium channels uh, it's very hard to know where they are compared to the vesicles, but we know that they are there, somewhere. So we know that they might be very close to the vesicle. Actually, they might be in the boundary layer of the vesicle. So for this, I derived uh, a, mo uh, a model of the active zone organization. So let's put the vesicles on the lattice and still uh, use our system to, to look at uh, binding, right? Our model. <laughs> so the vesicle has sphere. We know the radius is like 20 nanometers. This is very standard. It doesn't change much across neurons. And we know the distance between vesicles. This has been computed and it's between like 60 and 155 nanometers. And channels, they can be, we, we don't really know, but people have uh, evidences that they might sometimes be clustered and sometimes not. So Okay, what's happening if I have a vesicle entering somewhere here where I am like in the boundary layer or extremely close to the boundary layer, so I don't know if I'm in or not. So, and the, the thing is, it's exactly what's happening at the synapse, right? So, to understand uh, the dynamic that was here, I used the splitting probability, which is the probability to reach the red target before getting lost inside of the terminal by, by crossing the orange boundary. So this splitting probability uh, is solution of this equation. And the question is now, okay, how should I solve that knowing that I have this uh, cusp here and I have a domain that is no more uh, symmetrical and I'm still in 3D, okay? Um, I had the, I tried few stuff, but it was not very convincing. So I end up doing the assumption that uh, this was uh, symmetrical by rotation, which is not uh, extremely perfect because it would it would say that this vesicle is everywhere around this one. You see, like a torus, uh, where the empty space would be the vesicles, and then. Uh, the, the, the particle would be inside the torus. But, okay, let's try. We can do simulations anyway, so we can check how bad our assumption is, right? And I wanted also to go back to 2D because I wanted to use what I had before. I wanted to use my conformal mapping. I wanted to use part of the solution. So I did these big assumptions, and then coming here, I'm, I, I'm like, okay, let's do the mapping again and see where we are. What I know is that most probably the dynamic here is going to be con sustained because the particle here is not going to see what's going to happen over there, right? So maybe I can capture something here. Uh, you do exactly the same analysis and uh, carefully you just don't go there because you don't want to see what's going to happen anyway. And the idea that my particles are entering on the blue line here, okay? They're entering through channels, through the membrane. They're not entering everywhere. So I'm just interested in what's going on here. 
So if I redo the asymptotic analysis and the match asymptotics, I'm going to end up with this equation. And now I have to find A. And actually, uh, what appeared when I was trying to find A analytically is that to resolve A he here, like what's happening here, you have to resolve what's happening everywhere in the domain. <coughs> um, so instead of doing that, that is not that easy, uh, I choose to estimate A using Brownian simulations. And I could finally get this equation where the part I, I so I could uh, derive what were the dependencies of A on R and epsilon and H, and then just fit this parameter using MATLAB. Uh, then you probably want to see how much this is good compared to reality, right? So I did Brunan simulations, and actually I was pretty happy to say that what's important is really the behavior at the boundary layer. And this I could capture, so all those stuff around didn't play a major role. So here you see the Brownian simulations in blue and the fitted approximation in magenta. Uh, where it's not very good is here when H is very small, because probably there the crowding is going to play a huge role. But otherwise, the, the particle in the boundary layer doesn't really see what's happening far away. So it, it was convincing enough for me to keep going with this approximation. So getting this result now, I can derive some formula for the activation probability. Let's say I need five ions to, to enter this zone to activate the vesicle. Then it's simply a binomial law, and it's like there is no more work to do. It's great, and I could. Um, I could uh, see what was the difference between vesicles that are very far away from each other or vesicles that are very close from each other and how the import what is the importance of having the channel that is close <coughs> or far and you see how fast it decreases and then you, you have results that you can give to people uh, during experiments such that, okay, they probably already had some guess but the crowding of vesicles is, should be associated with high release and the high release re re require a nanometer precision of channel, but if you cluster the channels, you might be able to recover a very high release probability. Such kind of results. Uh, the thing here is that I'm a bit cheating, actually, because um, if you look at the, the, the drawing I, I, I put, uh, to compute everything in my boundary layer, I considered uh, elementary domain, with reflecting boundary everywhere, saying like, OK, if I'm coming here, I'm going to be close to this vesicle, as is a lattice, it's symmetrical, so I should go back. <coughs> so actually, what I'm computing here is not the probability to arrive to a vesicle, to that vesicle, is the probability to arrive to one vesicle. And if you want to do a model that is more and more advanced, it doesn't make much sense to know that five ions just got bound on one of the eight vesicles, each different, right? There is, it doesn't make sense. So actually, the real problem you want to know is on which physical this calcium is going to go. So uh, this is actually uh, a harder problem, even harder problem, knowing that you are gonna, you're going to reach a physical before getting out of the small domain. On which physical are you going to are you going to bind? The, the closest, or the second closest, or the third closest, or the fourth closest, and so on and so on. Um, to solve this problem for my modeling approach, I choose to use, again, the Brownian simulations. But it's uh, open right now. So if uh, anyone thinks it's interesting and uh, have an idea of how we, we should solve that, uh, maybe we could try. But it's going to be linked to David's problem, because the particles that are going to the target before getting out are usually going straight. So you would end up with those like first particle going, and then you want to know where they are going. It's OK. I can resolve here. It's one false. But then it's way harder. And you've got these kind of curves that are very well represented by Boolean simulations. 
Yeah, theta is the angle here. So you choose a point here, and then it's like in theta. So it's 1 pi over 4 means I am on this line, right? So if I'm here, it's 1 over 4, 0 0.25. They are all reaching the same because you're close to all of them. If you're here, for sure, you're going you're gonna to attach. And the farther you go on this line, and the, the bigger the probability are going to be on every of the, of the thing. Um, what I could see is that you can very easily neglect, you can, so the, the, f the first five physicals are the one playing a role, and even the, the, the fifth one is just four points here, the after six and so on, you don't care anymore because the probability is so high you can neglect it, and neglect it very easily. The size of the, um, the, the height of the ribbon, defi the ribbon defining the, the hole, it's here. You see? So it's not dimensionless? Uh, no, not here. Not in this equation. You can make it dimensionless very easily by dividing everything by the radius of the small sphere, of the blue sphere, but it's uh, the same. So then, with this, you can estimate the flux fraction to vesicle I coming from a channel, which is what you're interested in. If you want to know which vesicle is going to fuse, how many vesicles are going to fuse, etc., etc., and what's the importance of having clusters of channel instead of uh, uniform distribution of channel, and so on. Yeah. It's not clear. Actually, they, they are not. It's not even sh like the the lattice is a bit uh, well, is already an assumption. Okay. Um, so they're just randomly located somewhere. This is not sure. No, it's not clear. It depends. Some synapses uh, looks like and they this, they observe very uh, shaped active zones, but uh, how much is it experimental um, bias, or how much it is due to real organization as a lattice or hexagonal lattice, it's not very clear. Like, there is no result that you can really follow. The idea is that this holds well if vesicles are really far away from each other, then they can be uniformly distributed on a lattice that you, you don't care because the particles are going to be out of the boundary layer very quickly, so those reflecting boundaries are not going to matter. Uh, for more packed vesicles, then the lattice is, let's say, a first order, you know, Taylor type approximation of the way they are positioned. You know, it's, uh, if you don't know, it's the putting the less uh, hypothesis on it is probably doing a lattice. But yeah, maybe hexagonal, but because there is no obvious evidence of this, <coughs> except if you need it to really go on for the computation but then... If it's a ball packing problem, typically you see hexagons rather than squares. Yeah, but it's... I'm not sure... And if it's, it's a ball not, packing. It's, like it's a random. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's probably not a packing. But because they're, they're binding... They're not binding uh, randomly because they need the snare organization to bind. And the snare proteins are somewhere, like they are at the active zone and they're waiting for the protein and then they're moving, but um, people don't know if there is uh, organization, special organization on the snares at the active zone because this is under the diffraction limit so those, this is information we are not, uh, we, we don't have. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I have a question about the, the role of this upper bound yeah. that you put. So I understand that from numerical simulations, for instance, it's important, but uh, I would, say, uh, I would say, for instance, the mean first passage time that you compute, it will depend on the area of the domain, and so it would be proportional to the height you put. And in some sense, height is, artif is you put it artificial, yeah. artificially, so you can put it twice higher or three times higher. Yeah, actually what <laughs> matters here is to have an elementary domain that is big enough so the boundary layer is fully inside. Okay, because the, the question is, are you inside of the boundary layer or outside of the boundary layer? So if you put twice as big, you're gonna change the result of the probability for sure, but you're not gonna change the behavior. You see what I mean? 
So yeah, uh, that's I put it just on top of the vesicle because it looked reasonable to me. But you can you can choose a different. Ah, uh, oh, uh, it's not gonna make a big difference. And maybe second question: You mentioned that it's important to know to which vesicle ions will yeah. go. But why it's important? Because it's one ion is not enough to trigger release. You need five, let's say five or eight ions per vesicle. So I cannot say like, oh yeah, there is a vesicle somewhere and just put it randomly uh, on one vesicle. You see what I mean? I need five vesicle, on five ions on one vesicle. And because I want to see what's the influence of clustering versus uniform distribution, I have to be precise enough so it makes sense. So the vesicle close to the cluster will get all the ions and the ones that are far will stay and it can change a lot uh, the distribution. So, okay. Now that I have all of these results, uh, I can build a bigger <laughs> model of uh, the terminal. So again, what was the rules, uh, the model, the biological model against this, calcium enters through voltage-gated calcium channel at the active zone where you have vesicles. They either bind to the complex here or they go to the bulk. And in the bulk, they have their own dynamic that is pretty well known. You have buffers molecule that can catch them or mitochondrion, let's say it's gonna have the same behavior as a buffer molecule. And you have pumps that are extruding the calcium and the ca calcium can just like leave the terminal through the, the, the end of the terminal. So calcium ions are gonna be Brownian particles. So now that I have these, this sketch, because I want to see what's the influence of the buffers and uh, et cetera, et cetera, on all of this. And especially this hypothesis of the high concentration here of ions that is going to trigger more vesicles. I wanted to test this one. So the, 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 what is the question here? The problem here is that if I would formulate this problem uh, using PDEs, it would be complicated uh, because I want to keep the geometry at the active zone because you have this localization or no localization of channels with the vesicle. And, and because vesicles are going to fuse, it means that I will have some uh, boundary that are going to be mixed boundaries, right? Sometimes the uh, vesicle is here and then you can be absorbed. Sometimes the vesicle is not here and then you cannot be absorbed. So I have the geometry that's going to be held if I don't do the numerics or whatever. Or analytics, I don't even talk about it. And I have a lot of particles. So a PDE representation would be very easy to write down, but I'm not sure we could do anything about it. Uh, at the same time, if I want to do stochastic simulations, it's going to be the same because I have small holes everywhere, buffers. Uh, it's, it's like the, that's the classical kinetic representation of, uh, of uh, um, chemical reactions, right? So it's spheres that are just meeting each other. So I have plenty of particles looking for small spheres that are small enough, so they are all independent. And those pumps are going <laughs> to be small binding sites as well. And this, this geometry, I could have avoided it, but it looks like this on the pictures. So probably not too stupid to have something. Uh, and it's, it doesn't cost much. So stochastic simulations here, is going to be hell. But from what I saw before, it looks like the stochastic, the, here the, the system is stochastic, right? In the sense that few particles have to reach a binding site, and it's a rare event, and it's well described by stochastic um, modeling. When here, uh, a very classical uh, mass action model is more suitable, right? Because it's just like, kinetic reaction in a, in a large bulk. So that's why we, I decided to build a multi-scale model where the bulk is represented by the, this kind of equation, continuum equation, and uh, the binding of the particles on, of the calcium ions on the vesicle is going to be Markovian. So I keep getting the stochastic part that is represented by a stochastic system of equation and the continuous part that is represented by classical mass action equations. So uh, 
I can go quickly because you probably know these equations, but like how would I build my Markov chain, for example? It's a very simple Markov chain where you have a flux of arriving ions that's gonna move you from zero to one to two, to et cetera, to threshold T, number of ions needed to uh, reach the threshold. And this uh, flux comes from all the work we did just before. This flux has two parts. The first part is coming from the channels and that I just uh, showed you the Brownian simulation that helped me uh, get an uh, approximation of this, numerical approximation of this flux. And the second part is coming from the ions coming back from the bulk to bind the target. And then I got this very simple uh, Markov chain for each vesicle separately. Um, in the bulk, it's again very simple. I have a mass action equation, right? So here is the number of free particles in the bulk, free calcium. So I have a binding from the buffers, for example, and then the binding on the, f on the, 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 binding on the free sites on the buffer. This represents uh, the influx of ions that are gonna enter the bulk, so the ones that didn't bind to the target. And here you have uh, extrusion to the pump, escape through the neck, uh, arriving at the target, that depends on how many free sites I have on the target. And this is the release of a vesicle. Uh, each time a vesicle is released, I'm gonna release a few ions in the bulk. This, this term is not extremely important, but you have to make a choice what you do with those five ions each time you have a vesicle released. And because we have few ions in the end, it can make a difference in simulation if you don't make a decision for those ions. And here you have the, the number of bound ions to the, to the buffers. So it's, it's, it's just a mass action model. And because I want to stay consistent, what are going to be my parameters estimation? Actually, if you, if you look at the Smolochowski formula for the binding of uh, the, 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 the reaction of the chemical reactions, there is a relation between the rate and the mean first passage time, right? Because you always consider that this rate is coming from the fact that you're in the big bulk and then the, the, the two molecules are gonna meet. So I just choose to take, to stay coherent with the, the study I did at the, at the active zone, to take the mean binding time to a buffer, the mean escape time to a, to, to a pump to be a mean first passage time. And because we know that the, the holes are small, we know that those time are um, exponentially distributed at first order, exponential low, so this arrival time are Poissonian, which fits exactly uh, the mass action model. So it's coherent then. So we could derive all those, all those uh, mean for special time we derived previously, and then I'm, I'm using the one I derived uh, for the Snell complex. And then binding rate, you can find some stuff in literature depends of where you're working on. So uh, I end up with something that's supposed to give me the release probability, the full terminal, right? So let's look at the distribution of the release times for uniform channel distribution. So here I just plot the number of free ions in the bulk depending on how many buffers I get. So if I have no buffers, the extrusion time depends just on the pumps and the way of going out. And you see that I have very high um, calcium inside my terminal. So what do I get in terms of release time? I have a very high peak due to the arriving of calcium from the, the, the channels that are just gonna arrive and bind directly because they are inside the boundary layer of my, um, of my, uh, my, my target, my uh, ribbon. And then you're gonna have this distribution, which are the, the ions coming back from the bulk and that keep binding. That is due to the flux uh, I first computed uh, that the ions coming from the bulk to the target. If you increase the number of buffers, what you observe is that this second part for sure is gonna disappear because this flux di is directly um, related to the number of ions in the bulk. So what we have here, and that is interesting in a biological point of view, is that we have a biphasic phase of the release, right? You have the release due to the, to the pulse, and then you have a, a release that is due to the ions that stays inside the bulk. This is already 
This is already a very interesting result uh, if you want to take a look at release probability and ectopic release and what could cause this ectopic release. Um, okay. Next, uh, you can also take a look at the number of fused vesicles. So here I just can, so you have two ways to do simulations in this case. You can either do stochastic simulations with a Gillespie type algorithm, or you can do um, or you can do stochast uh, stochastic simulations, or you can do uh, ODE uh, solving, because everything reduces to ODEs now. So just to see that those two are really well matching. <coughs> so here you have again the calcium. Uh, peak inside the terminal and then the buffering of calcium and we can observe the number of activated targets depending on the buffer so one of the predictions we have here is that even though you have exactly the same um, the same um, physiological characteristics which is what we observe in the climbing fibers and the parallel fibers you can go from very high release probability to very low release probability by simply adjusting the number of buffers this is a uh, result. Uh, how buffers uh, behave in presynaptic terminals is really not well known. It's, it's not a, an easy question. So this is, uh, again, the results we, we have here. Um, the other thing that is uh, interesting and nice is that we can perform some uh, analytic computation of the activation probability. So. Here, it's a simple as resolution of the Markov model that is actually kind of simple model to solve. It's, it's coupled to the number of free particles. So when I'm writing this, it's still coupled to the, 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 the ODE model, but it's a result per se if you have a, a good idea of what this could be. That is something you could have from experiments. You can still derive uh, the activation probability pretty easily. And the other thing is that uh, we could, for example, uh, look at the activation probability of the, the first spike. So I was telling you this would tell you uh, the, the release uh, probability, high release probability or low release probability uh, by simply uh, solving this. And because I observed numerically and it makes sense that the flux of ions coming from the bulk during the first uh, spike is extremely small which makes sense because it's a very short time and it takes time for those ions to come back, um, I can end up with a formula that is uh, in itself uh, consistent. And when I compare with Brownian simulation, I observe some discrepancy that is probably due here to the fact that I neglected the number of ions coming back from the bulk. But uh, if you need five ions, you see that here the Brownian simulations and the, uh, the analysis match very well. So with this kind of modeling, we could find some analytical results for the release probability. Uh, and finally, it's going to be the last, I promise, and then uh, the workshop is done. Uh, this is the, the, the end of this work that is not yet published, uh, is what's happening when you have several spikes. Do we have facilitation? Do we have depression? Can we? Can we have an idea of what is monitoring facilitation and depression and what other tools the synapse has to decide if it's going to facilitate or, de or be depressed? So here, I, so I didn't put, again, the, the equations, but I had to modify a bit the equations to take into account that I wanted to have several spikes so that the, 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 the fusion of a vesicle was not uh, a, um, the end per se. And also I added the unbinding from the snare. So unbinding from the snare, again, is a question that has uh, been debated a lot. How, what's the unbinding rate? And it's not that easy because <coughs> it's complicated uh, conformational changes and you have several domains. But what I can predict here is, is what's happening if you have a fast snare unbinding or a slow snare unbinding. If you have a fast snare unbinding, this model predicts that nothing is happening. Okay, this the model shows that your your the distribution of release time is going to be always the same, and your synapse is going to be extremely reliable, always responding the same way. But if you got a slow unbinding from the snares, then you start to get something. You start to get those uh, double shape. You start to get 
depending on the number of buffers, uh, your, synapse, your synapse can go from facilitating here to depressing here. So this curve represents the ratio of the, two, the, the first two spikes. So this, this means that probably the, the unbinding from the snare has to be slow, otherwise you're losing everything. You're losing all the information. Why? Because it's not the ions coming from the bulk that are determining how many uh, vesicles are going to be released. It's the, the ions that were already bound on the snare to prime it that are going to make the difference. So if you remove this, then you're going to lose your, your synaptic plasticity. So okay, this <coughs> is a result we have. And we could also work on the, on the docking time and get different results. Uh, this is not finished yet, but we're going to like finish interpreting the results in terms of biology and, uh, and we're going to see what we're going to have. So, okay, I want to thank David because this work was really done uh, in his lab when I was working with him. Uh, I enjoyed a lot my time with David. Uh, I enjoyed a lot my time at UBC as well, but I was working on different, different things. So if you want to go sabbatical in Paris, you should. <laughs> it's, it's really in the center of Paris is great and uh, and you're gonna see it's fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so questions? Okay, let's start. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is technical. So when you computed the mean first passage time, so you started with uh, uh, a small sphere inside a larger sphere. Yeah. But then in the, in the larger model, it was small spheres lying on, on, on the plate, somehow on, on, on a plane. So is this change in the geometry important or not yes. uh, when you compute the mean first passage time? So, so in such the curvature of the larger sphere doesn't matter or not? Yeah, actually, I mean, this kind of uh, geometry after that, mm -hmm. where the small sphere is very small compared to the large sphere. Yes. And I have several spheres that are like independent. So mm -hmm. that's why I consider only one. So uh, the, um, the R, which is, which is the radius of the big one, doesn't play major all because if R is going to infinity, um, then the, the parameter where it's going is just going to stay on the small one. But I still need a bounded domain, right? Because if I have yeah. in motion in an unbounded domain, then I have a completely different uh, behavior. So let's say just R is way bigger than on the drawings I did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But if I do the, the real one, <laughs> that's more like, this is more like the sizes I'm interested in, mm -hmm. then you, 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 don't, you don't see. It's uh, for illustration purpose. Okay. But it's still, it's still kind of spherical. And we know that in brain and motion, we don't mm -hmm. care. And you know that better than mm -hmm. us. We really don't care that much on how spherical it is, mm -hmm. except at the whole. It's mm -hmm. still kind of spherical. It's just like way bigger. OK. And, and a, a second question for, for this uh, snare, snare complexes. Uh, I, I guess they're not so small. I guess there should be few few nanometers, right? So and if you yeah. compare to the size of the vesicle, which is 20 nanometer, so finally, this uh, relative epsilon, so the ratio between them, it's not so small parameter. Uh, uh, is it true or not? Um, so what did I took when I show you um, epsilon equal 1? So I, I took 1 for 20. So this is the range you just told me about. OK. Uh, it's, it's not something that we know for sure. Mm -hmm. It's reasonable. The idea is that because, in, because it's going to be stable in a range, like a bit bigger mm -hmm. or way smaller is going to work, you feel like it's coherent. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the number in itself, actually, the number in itself doesn't really matter in the sense that it's what's important here is that you have different time scales. And you're catching the different time scales with the formulas. So the time to go back from the bulk to the target is going to be in seconds. It's maybe not, I have 4.1 seconds. It's probably not 4.1, but it's seconds. When the time to go from the target, from, from the, 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 the channel to the target, when you're inside the boundary layer, is going to be microseconds. Mm -hmm. So you have six orders of magnitude. This is what matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if the numbers are probably not correct, the orders of magnitude 
um, they must be captured by this kind of modeling, which is what, what matters here to me, I think. Thank you. So I think that my, maybe my first question is actually the same as Dennis's first question, but let me just, just make sure I understand. So for the, the first geometry you put up, it's, it, it is correct that the, the leading order behavior of the mean first passes time does not depend on the sh that the outer sphere is in fact a sphere. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. This is what uh, Dennis showed right. us, right? So yeah, what's important is the behavior um, Just locally, at the, at the locally and to be bounded. Otherwise, the mean first pass time doesn't make any sense, especially in 3D, because sure. we know all the Polya theorem that say that, that the drunk bird is never going to find his nest again, right? So yeah. And my, my second question is, um, I think with, with regard to the simulations of that, so maybe if you just back up a slide or two, or three, uh, there, yeah, those. Yeah, yeah so I mean, so it's, of course, it's really impressive how well the simulations match yeah. the, the asymptotics. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, so epsilon, even when epsilon is, looks like 10 to the minus three, you're spot on. Yeah, here. Yeah, so do you have a sense of when, at, at what level of epsilon that starts to break down? Um, okay, here, for the 2D problem, it's breaking down pretty quickly because 2D is always less, the, the, the second order term in the 2D problem, I feel like is very often stronger. But for the 3D problem, you can go uh, actually pretty far. So here, I have one for 20. This is the this is the the, the, the ratio I think I took here. The, the, what's important here is the ratio between epsilon and r, right? right? Um, for the three D, uh, it's it stays good, actually long enough. So I didn't care about it for my problem. Uh, I don't remember until when I tried. Okay, I and 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 so the the simulation you're just doing a like a naive time stepping, you just have some fixed DT? Uh, yeah, no, so fixed DT, if you have a mean for a small hole problem and you're doing brilliant simulation with fixed DT, you better have a huge computer or a lot of time to spend because it's... it's so you're, it's you're dynamically making it smaller when you're yeah. close to the hole? Or, okay. So you have to... Uh, yeah, I was using these kind of techniques. Um, you, you know for sure that uh, delta x square is going to be in, uh, let's say, 3D, 6D delta t, right? So you have a relationship between the mean square displacement and the time step. So you have to make sure that your mean square displacement, the, your time step is small enough that the mean square displacement is not just going to miss the hole, right? <laughs> so the thing is here, what matters is that you miss you, the time step is not too big, so I'm not just going to go out of the sphere numerically because I just, when I reflect, I'm so far away that I'm still not in the sphere and then everything is crashing. But here what's very important is to be small enough to, so that you actually reach the target. But if you take this delta t here, you're going to wait for, 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 for months. So I was using an adaptive time step depending on the distance to the hole, and I calibrated this, uh, checking the convergence of my simulation depending on how small the target, w the, 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 the delta t was. This was the, but otherwise you cannot do that. And that's why you cannot do easily, I couldn't do easily a full stochastic model that I wanted to do naively first year PhD. Um, because when you have several particles and you want to do adaptive time steps because you have small holes, because you have to take into account all the particles, actually it's even worse than, like it doesn't help. So you, you end up with something that is as long as if you would do the naive Brownian, which is not possible, so. I have a quick question about the limitations in the tiny little corner. So like there is that tiny little region epsilon, but yet we use the mean first passage time as an approximation, right? But maybe in these tiny little gaps, there is some limit because a particle has a finite size. Yeah. So is there ever like, do you know the ballpark range where you have to think of the particle as being like uh, that has non-zero size in a way? 
Um, Do we ever have to worry about that in these calculations? The thing is, if you worry about that, you have to worry about ion-ion interactions That's and van der Waals yeah. interactions, and the Brownian motion is anyway completely out of yeah. what you want. So if you reach the scale, uh, then you have to redo all what, like your boundary layer is going to be different because yeah. it has to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's why we choose this, <coughs> because actually the, 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 the people doing biology, they usually represent the, the, the one, the synaptotagmin where the stuff is binding like this, right? Mm. And then you have the ions coming and blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah. If, and then you, and the, and the, you have a, and they have, you have a size. Amazing, they have a size. You have amazing data on the molecular yeah, biology, yeah. and they have a size. Yeah. The thing is, it doesn't make sense for me to reach this scale yeah. because exactly of what you said. Yeah. So I prefer to say, okay, if you're somewhere around here, yeah. then it's a different story, yeah. and I'm going to consider that you're going to be trapped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you still are in a regime where you can use the diffuse, the product diffuse yeah. approximation, and because that's just a level of complexity that's way too much. I think it's way yeah. too much, and I think it doesn't make sense anymore yeah, to yeah, do yeah. this way if you want to reach the scale. And then you have a scale problem. You're not at the correct scale. Right. So that's why the ribbon is not that bad approximation to me. Right. So you <coughs> uh, just, I wanted to say, before giving you the microphone, um, just a comment. So finally, this mean first passage time narrow escape allows us to build, let's say, a, a sort of intermediate model, like a mesoscopic type model between, as you said, stochastic diffusion where you had to follow all particles, where it involves usually thousands of particles, and already thousands of particles when you have this narrow uh, or, or small hole it's it's very it's very consuming and um an approach which is purely mass action which disregard the fact that the number of particles that are needed to activate are of a f are of the order of a few so how do you connect how do you connect how do you build such a model and by having computing uh, as you've shown this mean for special time to a cusp you can neglect or remove what happened in this structure and the difficulty is, of course, I mean, what difficulty is to correctly connect the mass action to this uh, stochastic uh, event that can very, uh, uh, are very well approximated by the <coughs> that is Markov chains. So this was one thing. And the second thing that, which is remarkable about the biology is that indeed the position of the source is very close to the target. And this is like putting something in the boundary layer or in the position where exactly you go from the end of the, let's say the middle of the boundary, boundary layer to the bulk. And so because you are at, at this intermediate regime, this makes this uh, all analysis complicated. You cannot say you are far away so you neglect the position. You have to account for the initial position in a very fancy shape. And basically by this, it turned out that what people thought about, because th there is no um, experimental setting to look at what happened in this very tiny layer of the, uh, the size of 50 nanometer. The idea was, okay, you need an, a, an increase of calcium inside the entire things and inside the entire synapse. But here, what um, was uh, the, the message that came out of, this, uh, out of this study is that no, what is important is what is in this boundary layer in between vesicles and the membrane. And this is where you have few calcium, and yet this is where you have the physiology is hidden, not inside the bulk. This is the output. Dennis. Uh, just a short biological question uh, related to, uh, to image. Are there data showing how the snare complexes are distributed on the vesicle? So for instance, you model them as just this ribbon around, but uh, maybe they are somehow yeah. uniformly distributed or whatever, cluster it? Yeah, no, it's very, a it's very, uh, good question. So actually, uh, you have data. So the SNARE complex is not one protein, it's a complex of protein. And it's looking like an analysis around the, 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 the sphere. So they usually draw it that way. Uh, 
kind of protein that, and then you would have the vesicle on top here, you see. And what they have shown is that the conformal change that's happening, and then once this structure is activated, it's going to be like the, the, the window of a boat, you know, when it's opening like this and closing like this, because it's stretching the two membranes that are going to, like, fuse and then open. So yeah, you have such uh, cylindrical structure, but again, I don't want to I'm happy that I have such a cylindrical structure because if the receptor would be on the top of the vesicle, this study would have to be redone. It's not the case, but I don't want to enter too much into the details here. But it's just important that, yeah, you can, you can probably bound everywhere. You have the synaptotagmin with the sensor for the calcium. They are known to be everywhere. You have plenty of them. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's really a Taylor approximation, you see, in the term of biology. Thank you. Yeah, just to answer quickly your question, there are new papers of uh, Jim Rothman, you know, the guy with Nobel Prize about this. He's continuing investigating experimentally how they are positioned, as just Claire mentioned, what if there are interactions, and how this protein can be buffers that can capture ions. But if you capture two ions for one, and you don't reach four, then you still have to wait. But if two ions are bound to the next one, if one of these ions is released, it can bind to this one. So there is probably here some cooperativity that could be f in the future incorporated. But it's still a very active domain in the, in the term of experimental. Okay, um, let's close this uh, second week. It was fantastic uh, to have all of you here. I think uh, we have learned a lot about uh, different type of problem uh, based really on uh, um, asymptotics, on the statistical physics of uh, diffusion and what happened when the diffusion coefficient um, is not constant and through all of these methods and, and, and uh, numerical uh, uh, simulations that are very important for the, for example, what we have uh, heard about the distribution of uh, the uh, different target and also the motion of the target. And I think, uh, and, and, and this asymptotics, and we had also different type of, of asymptotics and to leading order what happened when things cannot be seen. And this is also something that um, is important in the field. So I thank you, all of you, for uh, this week. And hopefully in the future, in a couple of years from now, something like this could be, uh, you know, done again somewhere in the world. Thank you again.